<laughs> yeah, baby. Are you ready to rock and roll with big sales? I just love that comment there. I'm going to leave that between me and Xander. Please hit the like button. You know, we're packed today. We will be packed for the entire week. Today, we have Hollis Thomas, hour number two at 4.30. Eagle Legend. Tomorrow, Ice Cube. Thursday, Chris Sims. Friday, a special guest. I'm going to leave that there for us. And I'm going to hang that out there for us a little bit there. So on Friday, a special guest, and we welcome you aboard here. You know, I tell you guys this all the time. I am a massive fan of lists. I'm also a massive fan of people who throw predictions out and who will throw, like, their thoughts on how a team, how an athlete, how somebody is going to perform – before, obviously, that respected season starts. And we all do this. This is kind of what sports talk is, right? But I got a guy who does these lists that I kind of like. He and I hate each other, too. But you want to know something here about Big Sills? I may not like you, but respect your work. I do not like Pete Persco. He and I have gone back and forth forever. I was on his station once. And he had a cow with me being on his station. And he like called his program director and the program director told him to shut up because at the time the company wanted my show aired in Tampa, Orlando, Miami, and Jacksonville. And he had a cow with it. And I went on the air and someone goes, hey, did you hear Prisco's talking shit on you on his afternoon show in Jacksonville? He does an afternoon radio show, by the way, besides working for CBSSports.com. And he's done this show forever. And he goes, did you hear Prisco was talking shit on you? And so you know what Big Sills does. Who's Pete Prisco? <laughs> and people were like, holy cow. He's this guy's one of the like big voices in the NFL. Like, oh, how come I've never heard of him? And what really sucks is he's a paisan. So I'm assuming he's a northern Italian. Because, you know, northern Italians are more like French folks. They're not really Italians. <laughs> they like white sauce. Do you know what I mean? I mean, Big Sills is a red sauce guy. And if you're more towards the boot, you're more red sauce. How you doing, right? <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a red sauce guy. He's a white sauce guy, and it's all right. You know, we're practically paisans. It's okay. You know, I mean, he you, know, you, can, you can like white sauce and be – I guess in a, an Italian too, but you know, like I said, you're you're closer to France than you are really to Italy. So hey, you know, eh, I'm not an Alfredo white sauce guy, and I don't like fettuccine. I like angel hair pasta, and I like red sauce, red sauce. I don't like Manhattan clam chowder. I mean, I like Manhattan clam chowder. I don't like the other clam chowder. How you done? Okay, I'm a red sauce guy. But I do respect his work. Yes. Yes. Sauce discrimination. Yes. Sorry. I, I discriminate when it comes to white sauce and red sauce. Yes, I do. If you're going to call Cilio a racist on one thing, it's red sauce and white sauce. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. I admit it. <laughs> Maybe the first time in that. Yeah, I don't like Chardonnay either. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Merlot guy. I don't know why. Everything's got to be red wine and red sauce. Sorry about that. Okay, right? New England clam chowder. Holy cow, the white sauce? What are you? Oh, my God. You know, you're not, not working for me. Anyway, so Pete Prisco, I'm sure many of you know the name. He came out with his top 100 players. I got the list here, but I want to throw this out at you, and I'm going to make an Eagle topic out of it. What do you think the national perception is this year of this group of Philadelphia Eagles as we're just about a month out from training camp? What do you think is the perception about this team? You're not sure? Unknowns? Quarterback? Coach? How's AJ? And hey, by the way, you and I can talk about all the optimism. And we have been. But I think here's the national perspective, because I'm going to make a point to you here. 
Okay, I'm going to make a point to you here. I think the national perspective on the Eagles is this. A lot of question marks. Is the quarterback the guy? Is the coach the guy? Is Jonathan Gannon a good D coordinator? How are they going to use Jordan Davis? Is the Kobe Dean what some people in the draft world thought was a reach, and that's why he fell down to the third round? Okay? Is Devontae Smith going to be the star that everyone's hoping for? Is that old line going to stay intact to be the best old line in pro? All these questions. Sixth or seventh in the playoffs? Playoff contender? That's a good question. Do you think the national perspective is that the Eagles are a playoff contender? I, I, I do. Ryan says divisional round playoff team. That's pretty big. Okay? Das says this is what makes our fans so much better than Cowboy fans. We are always cautious. Meanwhile, if this roster was in Dallas, they would be screaming Super Bowl. Dead on. Dead on, Daz. But I'm going to make a point to you right here. I'm not going to read the top 100 players here. But what I am going to do is I'm going to tell you what Prisco says, where your Eagle guys are in his eyes on the top 100 players in the NFL. This is on CBSSports.com. His top 10 players, he and I were right. I think Aaron Donald's the best player in football. He's got Rodgers, number two, Mahomes, number three, Josh Allen, four, Cooper Cup, five, Tom Brady, six, TJ Watt of the Steelers, seven, Trent Williams, 49ers, eight, he is. Eventually, possibly, Jordan Malata could take his seat as the best tackle in the game. He's not. Trent Williams is by far. It's a pretty big gap. The best tackle in the game. Miles Garrett, nine. And Jalen Ramsey, number 10. So the Rams have the number one and number 10 best players in the NFL, according to Pete Prisco. Where do you think the Eagle guys are? This is pr – Prisco is pretty respected. If I'm reading it, I respect his work. I just don't like the guy. I think the guy's a douche. But I actually like his work, okay? Here's where Pete Prisco has the Eagle guys ranked. Jordan Mulata, number 75. Darius Slay, number 85. Top 100 players, according to Pete Prisco and CBSSports.com. Lane Johnson, number 90. And A.J. Brown, number 94. So Pete Prisco doesn't have an eagle in the top 50 players in the NFL. And by the way, I looked around. I think a lot of people have that same notion. So you don't really have a lot of respect nationally on how people are looking at your roster when it comes to talent. There's a guy that does this for a living. He actually goes on to CBS uh, show for the NFL on Sunday. And that's not a lot of respect. 75, 85, 90, 94. You're in the bottom third with four players on your roster. And he only named four of them. What kind of team goes on and wins a divisional crown and then goes on and plays in the divisional rounds? Wins a playoff game. Not somebody with four players in the top 100. There's not a, I don't think this is a lot of respect. Jordan Mulata, 75. Boy, that's pretty low. Darius Slay, who made the Pro Bowl, 85. Lane Johnson, 90. The 90th best player. And you're talking about a guy who's a perennial pro bowler, an all-pro player. 90. You don't have – get this. You have one player in the top 75, according to Pete Prisco and CBSSports.com. Philly says it doesn't mean anything. 
doesn't it? Well, here, let's throw this at you here. Are we overrating the talent on the team? Are we overrating it? Jalen Hurts is nowhere to be seen on that list. He's not even in the honorable mention stuff. Okay? He's not. Devontae Smith is not even mentioned. Not one guy on the defensive front seven is mentioned in the top 100 names. No, you, you think that's nothing. Seals, why are you tired of Curry? Uh, I'll get to Curry here. Um, I'll get to Steph Curry. They got a 3-2 lead last night. I watch it, okay? I, I, I watch it. I, don't, I think the kid Wiggins actually may take the finals MVP, but we'll get to that in a little bit later. Those lists don't make no difference. What matters is what you do once you get on the field. Of course, Davey. I'm talking about the perception of how people see the Eagles nationally versus how we're seeing it. We're thinking that this Eagle team's going to win. A team that has the potential to win 13 games doesn't have four players that people perceive as really great players. There's a boatload more. Come on, Dan. AJ not being top 50 is a joke. This ain't me. This ain't me, and this is why the question I'm asking you, I, do I think that AJ – hey, do I think Jordan Milan is a top 50 player in the NFL? All the great players, top 50, he's around there. Darius Slay, do I think he's a top 50? No, probably top 60 players. Lane Johnson, I think Lane's around 50. Not 90. A.J. Brown, is he a top 50 player? Yeah. 94? (laughs) You're six spots from the bottom. Again, this is more. I'm not talking about true talent here. I'm talking how people see the Eagles. People think that you guys are good, not great. And you know why? Because the quarterback's not great. This comes down to how people see the people see the Eagles through the prism of Jalen Hurts with a lot of question marks. You can have all the talent on the planet, but you're only going to be perceived by how people look at your quarterback on your team. Is it right? No. But there's no other excuse for this. I saw four Eagle guys in the top 100 players. I'm like, holy shit, wait a minute here. I'm saying you're going to win 13 games? Look, I know people's people's perspectives are different than others. I'm, I'm, I'm not going down there. My list would be completely different than his, I think at least from 30 down. But he's not alone in how they see the Eagles. They see it through Jalen Hurts' abilities. Okay? Like when you look at the Packers, even though they, lo- they lost Devontae Adams, oh, Aaron Rodgers is there. Tom Brady. Buccaneers. When you think of the Philadelphia Eagles, what do you think of? A questionable quarterback. That's what Pete is doing here, in my opinion. Kenneth goes, what about Kelsey? Not even mentioned. Master says, we may not have a top 100, but we have a load of top 200 players. 200 players? So you don't have any. The Rams have two in the top 10. That's why they're Super Bowl champs. We don't have anybody in the top 20. So you're saying to me this. That every position on the Philadelphia Eagles, there's not a top 10 guy. That's what they're saying here. That Milata's not a top 10 tackle. That Slay's not a top 10 corner. That Lang's not a top 10 tackle. That AJ is not a top 10 wideout. That's what that is. I looked at the list. 
They got other people ranked ahead of them and multiple guys at the positions that they play. You don't have a top 10 guy at any position on your team, and we're going to win 13 games. Interesting. It always gets brought back to Hurts. Eddie, I'm not doing this. You tell me, okay then, Eddie, you tell me then, you think four players being mentioned in a guy's top 100 who's considered to be one of their main analysts, CBS, is saying that you only have four players in the top 100. That's not a ringing endorsement to the upcoming season that they think the Eagles are going to have a great year. They still think Dallas is the team to beat in the NFC East. That's fine. I'm talking about how other people – are we overvaluing our guys? You know, we, we've been drinking the Howie Roseman juice now for about two months since the draft. Are we drunk with it? I agree with you, Philly. I think Lane Johnson gets no respect. He has been a fine ball player. He has been an absolute fine ball player. Big Seal's drunk and Howie. Uh, nothing like a good glass of warm Howie Roseman amongst friends. Cheers. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Serving it warm, baby. Pete Prisco had Kenny Pickett in his top 10 for the draft. Smile. I, I'm, I'm making a point here using a national analyst. Just show and prove it on the field. Shut them all up. Absolutely. I don't think we're overvaluing our guys at all, says Eddie. Larry says, personally, I'd rather be slept on and prove it. Yeah. Under promise, over deliver. I'm a huge fan of that. That's it right there, Kevin. That's where I'm going, Kevin. Let me tell you something, folks. If I were this Philadelphia Eagle team, I would be wearing the banner of underdogs. You think my quarterback sucks? You don't think we have a lot of stars on our team? We're just a meat and potatoes team. We're a lunch pail team. You know, we got the miners caps on. We don't have the slick suits like they do in Dallas. And we're just going to go out there and we're going to go into the mine and we're going to dig for our gold. Rest of you people are hoping that it falls out of someone's pocket or that you find it on the ground. It's like people that play the lottery. Okay. You're hoping to somehow become a millionaire instantly when you know in your heart you got to dig for it anyway. That Eagle team should take that identity on. I don't want to hear about planting seeds and shit. I want to hear this. Hey, great. You don't think we're good? Fine. Then you go out there and beat the shit out of them. Then you go out there and run them over. Then you go out there and you inflict your will on people. Then they leave that game going, hey, man, I don't know what they thought of that Eagle team, but I'll tell you something, man. They only have four guys in the top 100. That's not the way I looked at it. It looked like they came at us in waves. That's the kind of football team I like. Xander goes, I'm done being the underdog. I'm done being the underdog to go in there like champions. I hate to inform Xander this, but the Philadelphia city alone is underdog. And it always has been. It always has been. You know why? They cover New York. They cover Dallas. They cover Chicago. They cover Los Angeles. Bro, why run from how people look at you Philadelphia is a tough city. Kobe played like an underdog. Kobe played like he had shit to prove every day. He is the prime example of your city. Kobe Bryant played like he had everything on the line and everything to prove every time he took to court. Where do you think he got that from? He got that because he was raised like that. When you're raised like that, you got a chip on your shoulder. I heard the guys on Sports Tape talking about chips on their shoulder. 
Here's the ultimate. There's the ultimate. Yes. Hey, man, it's the city of brotherly love. You know why? You guys are loyal to the soil. You don't appreciate people talking shit on you, do you? But you guys can talk shit on each other, correct? That's how I'm learning. Loyal to the soil. Hey, man, I'll tell you what. That guy, man, Roseman. But then you hear some dude in Chicago talking about it. You're like, I'll tell you what. Easy guy. He did win a Super Bowl in 17. And before you find yourself, you're, you're defending Howie Roseman, right? When somebody from the outside comes into your world and starts taking a piss on it. I like it. Who says you're not walking in like a champion knowing in your heart, hey, hey, dude, I played like that at the University of Miami. We all did. Jerome Brown included. Now, get this. They never thought much of us. Some private small school, a bunch of black kids and kids that had issues and problems, poor kids. And every time we walked into places, we didn't have the fancy facilities. We felt like underdogs and we killed you. That was Jimmy Johnson's mentality. Really? Don't schedule us. You know what the big joke used to be about UM? Don't schedule us for homecomings or stadium openings because we'll wreck your night. <laughs> hey, I can't tell you how many homecomings and opening of stadiums that we destroyed. We go into South Carolina one year. They open up that Bryce Stadium where the Gamecocks played. We beat them 38-10. And <laughs> they were like, Oh, this is – I think Sterling Sharp was on that team too. They they opened the stadium. Jerome looks over at me and goes, man, it's going to be a bad night for these folks. Place was packed, 80,000 people. We're sitting there going, we get out there, we kill that team. And we're walking off. And Jerome's telling everybody, man, hey, don't ever schedule UM for homecoming or for stadium openings or for alumni night. You'll have a tough one. I love that, man. I love that. Ronald, when we rock together and tell the league we don't give a shit about top 10 players, we care about only being number one. That's the attitude, Ronald. That is exactly the attitude. I saw this list and I was like, I can't wait. Because, look, we're payday's around the corner here. September's coming. September's coming. And you're going to get out against the Lions. Now, look, I've been critical of how they're practicing. You guys all know that. But, boy, if I was one of these players, man, and I start picking up, Jordan says it all the time. Go and watch his Hall of Fame induction speech. Okay? Go and watch his Hall of Fame speech. Adding a log to the fire. To me, this is a log to the fire. I'd be like this. Okay. So you don't think much of us? I got you. A.J. Brown, the 94th ranked player in the league. Philly loves and understands an underdog. That's why in 17 was so special. That's why we're loyal to Hurts. There it is, Nathan. There it is. You're right. You guys love Hurts because he's a guy who personifies Philly, the underdog. Dead on. Dead on. That may be the take of the last two months. You're rooting for him because he personifies how the outside world sees Philadelphia as underdogs. He's totally, of all the quarterbacks, who was not an underdog? Why? He was drafted like fifth overall. That's not an underdog. Okay? That's not. There's a massive difference between Jalen Hurts and Tua Tug of Viola. Tug of Viola took his job and was drafted fifth. That's not an underdog. That's the guy that's got to live up to the expectations. This guy took Hertz's job from him. Hertz had to leave, go somewhere else, prove himself. Joe Burrow plays like that. Tom Brady plays like an underdog. 
You think Brady, the way he posts those combine pictures and reminds people he was the 199th player taken is by accident? Brady's got a uh, he's got an underdog mentality. Chip on your shoulder. Brady plays with a lumber yard on his shoulder. This guy's got seven Super Bowl titles. And he plays like it. I think that's the identity of the team. Get your lunch pail. Let's go to work. I would bake shirts of that up. Get your lunch pail. Let's go to work. This football team has a great chance to go out and do some spectacular things this year. Shut people up. Look at Jordan Mulata, too. You know what he's fighting for? He's fighting for his place in the league. The 75th rated player in the league. Personally, I think Jordan Mulata is a top 10 offensive tackle in the league. I think Lane Johnson is, too. Lane has never gotten the respect. It's true. And I'll tell you something else that goes along with this conversation we're having here. Okay? Okay? Jason Kelsey, it's funny. When I first came on and started doing this show, Sills, you think Jason Kelsey's a Hall of Famer? No. Then after you watch him and you watch him get up to second levels and you watch the way he plays, you would say this. Well, if Kevin Mawai is an all, all-time all great center, Kelsey's better. Kelsey's better than Kevin Mawai. Okay, he's better. And I would say significantly better. For an undersized guy and for the amount of time he's put in and how he plays that position and keeps that entire unit intact like that, one of the best centers I've seen. I'll tell you, the best centers I've seen in my time and played against, uh, Ray Donaldson, Don Mosbar, Kelsey I watched. I did play against Bruce Matthews when Bruce had to move over from guard to center. Stepnoski wasn't yet ready to be a, a great, but he was good. Um, but Ray Donaldson, probably the best I played against. And Kelsey's better than them all. Don Mosbar was a great, great. Uh, uh, Kelsey's better than Saturday. Saturday's not a Hall of Famer. He's not a Hall of Famer. Kelsey is a Hall of Famer. Pouncey's a good player. Pouncey's, Kelsey's better than them all. Kelsey's another player that sits on the Mount Rushmore of what represents your city and the identity that you guys have. And, and, and you know, I, I get kind of Xander's point, too. Shit, man, I don't want to be anybody's underdog. I want, when you walk into a room, you look at that team and go like this. Damn. Here they are. And after a while, you get that tag. When we started walking into buildings, they feared us. Holy shit, it's that Miami team. These guys talk shit. And you know what? These guys, but sometimes we throw our helmet in there and we'd kill that team. He goes, I get that from Bama. Yeah, well, get this. We were first. Every place we walked into, uh-oh, here they are. There's a reason they make movies about the UM teams and have statues and books about us. There's a reason that there's a ton of 30 for 30s about us. The U is because of how we change college football. I don't see no 30 for 30s on Alabama yet. Okay, they're all about Big Sills' teams. You just said that you were underdogs for like 16 minutes. Yeah, we were. But then we won it over. And then people started looking at us going, holy shit, I'll tell you something. And Xander's right. That was our mentality. We never lost that mentality. But we knew in the back of our minds when we walked in, these teams feared us. But we had a ton of shit to prove. Dude, you know, when you walk into a place like uh, Gator Field and you walk into the Ben Hill Griffith Stadium and you see all those great facilities that they have, and you see all those fans, and you're like this. Some people walk in and go, wow, man, this is a great environment. We walk in going like this. I'm going to beat the living shit out of these 
fans team, then I'm going to wreak so much havoc on you, you're not going to believe it because you don't respect us. Raiders had it. The, the, the Raiders had that mystique. You know why? Because they were always shit on by the league. Always. But they had that mystique. Here come the Raiders. Holy cow. Hey, and get this. You know who the modern-day Raiders were? Brady's Patriots. The cheating scandal with the Spygate, Deflategate, Bullshitgate, whatever. Just like when Al used to turn sprinklers on for fast teams or have the headset. You know why that rule is in place, the headset rule? Because Al would have the other team's headsets not on in his at the Coliseum. <laughs> That's why that rule's intact, because Al used to have two, two bars of soap in the showers. It was crazy. I told you the story. When we went into Ohio State, I couldn't believe what the locker room looked like in Ohio State. It was pink. Four showers and two bars of soap, and there was so much starch on the towels. We couldn't believe it. And it was freezing. <laughs> I was like, this is home field advantage. Okay, that's home field advantage. I love that shit, man. I love the mystique. The UN players never forgot how people saw them. That's right, Ronald. They saw they saw many of us as gangsters, and they saw many of the back black players as kids who shouldn't be in college, kids who should not be in school. See, here. You know why Alabama's got an 80% admittance rate? Why do you think that is? Alabama's a fine institution, too. Why do you think that is? Because they work with their sports department. And they create dreams. They help fulfill dreams. That's why Notre Dame doesn't fulfill dreams. You can play at Notre Dame. You ain't winning shit at Notre Dame. 17% acceptance rate. <laughs> Who do you think you're beating? Why do you think Brian Kelly left? All about identity. All about having that identity. Look, look, you do develop that aura about yourself. I'll tell you this, that 17 Eagles team, after you beat, after, I'm going to tell you exactly what I said. After you guys beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl, I went, I swear to you, almost verbatim. I cannot believe that the New England Patriots got destroyed like that. Of all, there was only two other games, one other game, I think, that I saw New England destroyed. You remember a couple of years back when Kansas City crushed them in KC, famous line, Ron to Cincinnati, it was next week, and they got destroyed by Andy Reid's uh, Chiefs. When you guys beat that Patriot team, it wasn't so much that you beat them on the scoreboard. I went away like this. That's got to be one of the biggest ass weapons I've ever seen by a football team put on a dynasty team that was still in the dynasty run. They won a Super Bowl the next year. You hammered that team. It was relentless. 60 minutes of ass kicking. The respect that the players got on that 2017 Eagle team from the league. Dude, I was talking about it on the air the next day going, okay, you want to know what an ass beating is? That is it right there. That's why today I continue to tell you guys, best combination of defensive line and offensive line I have seen since the Steelers. Complete and thorough domination on the scoreboard and in your hearts and soul. Okay? Unbelievable. Now, you tell me if that team had that underdog mentality but yet inflicted their will. That's an aura. There will always be an aura about that 17 team, won't there be? The parade proves it a little bit. There's an aura about that gang green team. There's an aura about those guys. Holy shit, it's a body bag game. Holy shit, it's a bounty game. They were so arrogant 
They named their games Body Bag Game. They had names for their games. So freaking awesome. <laughs> hey, they had themes for the games that they were playing, and they were public with it. It's the bounty game. What? <laughs> Dude. That fires me up, man. That fires me up. And if I was this group, I'd start to put a little let in my gas can, and I'd start saying a little bit of this. Let's all put a little bit of that ass kicking into the STP bottle, put it in our gas tanks, and let's go do this. I can't wait for September. These guys have so much to prove. 60 minutes of football every single day. This is not going to be a football team that's going to go out and beat teams by 25 points. This is going to be a football team that goes out and has to play 60 minutes of ball. And get this, could get beat. Okay, could get beat in the final minute. You got to play 60. This is not a team. Like, say the Rams who can get up on you 35 points or the Chiefs. House of pain game. Look at you guys. Look at how you guys are. Dude, you guys had names for games. That is so great. <laughs> hey. That is so great. So great. Four guys, Pete Prisco from CBS, sports.com has from the Eagles. Four dudes. I would be like, Oh, man, I can't wait to go play against the Lions and the Vikings and the Commanders and the Cowboys. I can't wait, the Jags. I can't wait for any of this, man. Man, my first five games getting ready to roll into that bye. They got the Cardinals there, too. I think it's the Cardinals. It's Cowboys. That's right. It's, it, it, it's Lions, Vikings, Commanders, Jaguars. I believe that's – Cards, yeah, cards and cowboys, dude, so good. Oh, man, so good. Mm. All right. I want to do this, too. We're going to have some – I'm going to throw a topic at you. Don't go crazy. Don't go crazy, okay? I don't want you to go crazy on it. I'm just throwing a topic out. Hey, it's your boy, Big Sales, Morgan & Morgan, where the fee is free. Meaning this, if you get hurt or injured on the job, choosing an attorney could be one of the most important things that you could do for your family. Getting the fair compensation that it so rightly deserves. And at Morgan & Morgan, this is what they do for the last 30 years. Collecting over $13.5 billion worth of compensation for their clients. 800 attorneys strong in offices in Philly, New York, Florida, across the country, are ready to do battle for you. Listen, there is no bigger law firm in the country when it comes to getting your true compensation than Morgan & Morgan. Call them at 800-512-1600. That's 800-512-1600. Look, the call is free. The consultation is free. 800-512-1600. Hey, open 24-7, seven days a week. And when you call them, do me a favor. Tell them Big Sill sent you. I'm John Morgan of Morgan & Morgan. When you're hit from behind in a car crash, the insurance company may try to say, you can't possibly be hurt. It was only a few miles an hour. It's simply not true. You see, here's the thing. Getting hit at 10 miles per hour is like falling off of this. 15 miles per hour, like this. And only 25 miles per hour, this. Injured, dial pound law. There's only one Morgan & Morgan. Go for the pulse and the pools. Go for the ooze and the oz. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com.
field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Seven, one, three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass. Free. You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. All right, did you know I was the mommy slam dunk champion? Really? <laughs> yes, really, don't sound so surprised. Let's see it. Oh, you're ready. All right, here we go. Let's hear the crowd. So go to right, go to left. Thank you, Mama. Mama, go up, up, up. She did it. Again. You can't avoid gravity, but United Healthcare can help you avoid financial surprises by helping you compare costs and doctor quality ratings. United Healthcare. Uh huh. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. National Football Show. Please hit the like button. Hollis Thomas will be with us in hour two, 4.30 Eastern time. Um, I'm trying to think. Of th there's really only one offensive line that's got a nickname, and that's the Washington Hogs, right? We got to get a nickname for that offensive line in Philly. We got to get a name for it. Got to get a name for it, man. I, we, I played on a line called The Walking Dead. It's true. And get this, man. At UM, they used to play like the battle theme for Star Wars when we ran out and they would introduce us. They would dim the lights at the Orange Bowl. And the four of us would be standing there, right? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. The lights would go, and then all the smoke. Of course, we invented the smoke. Everybody does the smoke, but that, where, do you, where the hell do you think you got it from? We, we, us running through the smoke, and all of a sudden, you'd have that smoke, and they'd be playing that song. Dun, 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 dun. The place would go dense. The lights, they'd have a little lights on. All of a sudden, they'd focus on us, and we'd come walking out, the four of us, like we were a steel curtain. And it was pretty intimidating. <laughs> oh, man. The Philly Punishers. The Pipe Layers. <laughs> uh, the Irish Connection, the Cowboys had that. Eh. The Maulers from the East. Maniac goes, Sills, was your move the Scoongeal spin? No, it was the... It was the Italian pancake when I put a guy on the back of his bonnet. The green machine. Like the mean machine. The green machine. Green machine. Green machine. Green machine. I like it. I'm going to put that one down. Green machine. We got to do a poll too, man. We're going to get the four best. I got a topic here. I'm, look, the guys are going to hate this topic, but wait a minute. Green machine. Got to get a got to get a nickname for the old line. The Stoutlanders. Oh, good run on words. The Stoutlanders. The Goomba Ghoulies. <laughs> yeah, Rafferty and them dudes. Yeah, Tom's a friend of mine. I like Tom, man. 
Let's see. The Stoutlanders. Do you guys like that? The Stout, the Philly Stoutlanders. Nah, eh, the coach would hate it. I like Green Machine, man. Hey, the Philly Plumbers. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was the Imperial March. That's right, Charles. Yeah, man. They they put the Imperial March when we come rolling out. Da, 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 da. And you could just see the opponent's faces when we came running out. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Especially at the OB. Not even not even Xander's boys could say this. Okay? And they'll never touch it. Dude, we didn't lose a game for 11 years at the place. That record 58 straight wins will never be broken. 58 straight home wins. Never be broken. I don't care about how many Alabama teams he has. I like that, man. Green Wall. The Philly Manhandlers. The Mamba Maulers. Ooh. The Mamba Maulers. Like it. Mamba Maulers. I like Mamba Maulers. Oh, yeah, JB, man, he led that whole charge like that, too. The Kelsey Chain. Why does everything have to be (laughs) prison-related? The nicknames don't have to be prison-related, okay? Oh, yeah, that's right. Way to go, Grease. That's right. The Electric Company with OJ. Probably the two most famous O-lines. OJ's Electric Company and um, the Hogs. Five Deadly Venoms, the Green Machine Maulers, Hamburger Hill over a thousand pounds of meat. <laughs> I love it. The Philly Wrecking Crew. Yeah, hey man, even the Flyers had nicknames. The Broad Street Brawlers, right? Hamburger Helpers. <laughs> Nah, nah, nothing hog. Green monsters. The green, dude, they're, hey, that's good too, Chris, because they're all gargantuan. Five pancakes. <laughs> yeah, five pancakes. Hey, right? The Grand Slam. The Philly Grand Slam. <laughs> the underdogs. Philly Paving. Oh my God. I would have a paving company t shirt if I was on that old line. I would, t- I would, oh, I would totally. The Buffet Boys. Nate. <laughs> hey, Nate, I don't think there's a lot of buffets. No, no, no. Wait, wait a minute, Nate. Between the D line and O line, there's some big horses in them too, right? Them two groups. Hey, hey. The, the, the buffet lines, ass kickling, tackling machine. Dave Schultz, Bobby Clark. The, the Flyers teams were one of my favorites, man. And they were killing my Islander teams back then. The Green Mountains, the Concrete Company. That's it, man. The Broad Street, hey, Broad Street Cement Company. <laughs> hey, the Green Wall. I like the green wall. The green wall. Green machine. Mamba maulers in the green wall. I like that, man. All right. Hey, I got a topic I want to throw at you here. Okay. Work with me. It's the off season. Wait, I guess. Are you ready? So I had a conversation today with Jacob Ullman. And you can go on my Twitter page and then you can Google who Jacob Ullman is. Jacob Ullman is the head of talent and VP of production at Fox Sports. 
And he was talking to me and saying how much they're looking forward to Sean Payton being part of the Fox broadcast. He doesn't believe it's going to be for long because Sean is still getting comments and calls from teams just to get, just to say hi. And Sean and him were talking and they were having conversation and it was reported when Jacob actually is the guy who reported it, but they gave it to another reporter, a South Florida guy that he was offered four years, $100 million to coach the Miami dolphins. That what was being thrown around. Do you understand that's $25 million a year? That's double what Belichick makes. Okay. It's double what Belichick makes. For him to go coach the Miami Dolphins, four years, $100 million, is what Stephen Ross was potentially going to pay. Okay. He was asked the question by Jacob, what would be some of the teams you'd be interested in coaching? And he goes, obviously the Dolphins I had conversations with. Um, the Chargers looks like that could be something that could be very special. There's a coach there already in Brandon Staley. He goes, I love what they're doing in Philly. I love what they're doing in Philly. Jacob goes, would you be interested in any of the New York jobs? He goes, well, both places haven't really figured it out yet. And he said, no. He goes, how about New England? Well, there's a coach there now. He goes, what you think of? Yeah, it's a great organization. Bob Kraft's a great owner. He's proven that. Remember, he went to a Super Bowl with Parcells. So he's always had a head guy there. Wait, wait, what do you mean? Wait, what do you mean no sills? Uh, no, wait a minute. I haven't even thrown, you know, where this is going. Sean Payton's overrated. Holy shit. You guys, let me get it out. Let me get the topic out. Holy cow. Let's do this. I, I think the only way that Sean Payton would coach the Eagles. If Jalen hurts fails. You fire Sirianni also, like they did Peterson. You bring in Peyton. Then you draft a quarterback. And I've got the list of the one, two, three, five quarterbacks in the top 43 who were listed today by Bledsoe. And you have him coach this young kid, Sean Peyton. I think Sean Payton is 60. Okay. Hold on. Show, whoa. Showtime. Showtime goes like this. Silio canning Sirianni already. For Sean Payton? Yeah. Why? I'd fire a player for a better player. They fired Tebow in Denver for Peyton Manning. <laughs> What's your point? If I can get a better player or a better coach... Why would I not want to do that? Sean and Howie wouldn't get along. Well, that's a Howie Roseman thing. You ain't right, brother. Wait a minute, man. Xander says Peyton won one Super Bowl with a Hall of Fame quarterback. I mean, Sean is cool, but he's not that great. Hmm. Somebody offered him. $100 $100 million over four years. Guarantee you, Jerry Jones regrets letting him walk out the building. That guy was Parcells' OC. You just let him roll out the building. Or, hey, Sean Payton to Dallas with more control. Oh, wait. Fuck, fuck that. <laughs> Did I see that? Wait a minute. I'll take Peyton, Davy boy. I take Peyton right now. So do you understand? Hey, Davy boy, 
there's people in here from Philly that are saying this, I'd rather have Nick Sirianni than Sean Payton as my coach. That's all you need to know. Sean Payton wouldn't last in Philly. He actually might like to practice. The Dolphins owner is a dummy. He is, Timmy. Timothy, he is, man. I think Stephen Ross is a loser. If McCarthy has a good year, Sean Payton will be the next coach. Doesn't have a, has a bad year in Dallas. Sean Payton will be the next coach in Dallas. I don't know. Because Sean's going to want per- – oh, wait. He's not going to get a lot of per- – he'll get – Wow. Would Jeffrey Lurie go after – Wait, you guys were going to go after Lincoln Riley, according to some people at WIP. You guys were going to go after Lincoln Riley. Okay? Lincoln Riley. You don't think he's going to want some control in the building? Would Jeffrey Lurie go like this? Man, Sean Payton or Howie? Who would I want as my face of my franchise? Sean or Howie? You think he'd stick with Howie? Man, I think he might. I think he might stick with Howie. Peyton is a great... Dude, can you imagine what... Well, here. Okay, think of this for a minute. Howie makes him a ton of money. Of course he would stick with Howie. Well, then stick to the business side of it. Stick to the business side of it. Great. He makes him a lot of money. I want to develop a quarterback, which they've never developed one since Donovan. Aren't you tired of that? Don't you think it's a coincidence that the last offensive-minded guru that you had in the building actually developed a quarterback in Andy Reid with Donovan McNabb? The rest of your coaches couldn't. Now you have a shot at getting Andy Reid back. In the face of Sean Payton, you have a chance. He'd be open. Hey, he named one of the teams as the Eagles. Tweet him. Ask him. Oh, by the way, so you know I'm not bullshitting? Jacob Oldman follows me on Twitter. Okay? I know him very well. Do you think Hertz will be good like everybody else? I think Hertz will be good like everybody else. I don't think he'll be great. I do think he'll be very good. Here. I think Jalen Hurts is going to be very good. Is that what you want me to say? Sure. Do I think he's going to be great or elite? No. I get Jimmy Johnson was a great coach, but him and Jerry was preaching to the players. Will there be enough credit to go around? Of course, he goes destroyed that, Flex. He goes destroy everything. Marriages, teams, businesses. It's a deadly sin. That's what makes what they did in New England so remarkable for 20 years. Those guys ate a lot of humble pie on each other when it came to who was getting the credit in New England. Brady and Belichick sat there for 20 years and said they were not going to go down the way of the Dallas Cowboys or they were going to go down the way of the Chicago Bulls or they were going to go down the way of the Kobe Shaq Lakers. They were not going to do that. They were going to keep that thing together as long as they could and to produce six Super Bowls. That's what, that's the most remarkable thing about that whole run. Whatever you think about it, cheating, non-cheating, it's still winning. Wait a minute, man. Five star goes, Sills really knows how to kick sand in your face. What what am I doing? I'm not. I'm having a conversation with you. Okay? (laughs) 
Oh, man. Is he good enough to win a Super Bowl with the right team around him? Yeah, I think a lot of quarterbacks that are good can win Super Bowls. A lot of good quarterbacks have won Super Bowls. Yeah. He's never going to be a team or he's never going to be a quarterback that is going to throw you out of trouble. It's just not. He's not a professional passer. Will he get better? Absolutely. I said it. He's going to get better. He's going to be a good player. For your, for your life, would you rather be your quarterback Wentz or Hurts to win a Super Bowl? God, I got to pick out of those two dudes? <laughs> well, one was benched. Well, the other one was benched too. I don't know. Let me get back to you on that one. <laughs> I'll get back to you. All right. Hey, Hollis Thomas will be with us at 430 Eastern time. I've got something else here for you. Okay. The 2023 NFL draft. Bledsoe just came out with a new list. I'm not going to go through all 32. I will give you the top 10 and the top five quarterbacks that have been rated as of this morning. Okay. I want to hit on that. Also want to expand a little bit. Sean Payton, you guys know? Yes? Things go sideways. You wouldn't make a run for him? Hit the like button. Hour two. Keep it here on the National Football Show. When choosing a lawyer for your injury case, you may ask, does the size of the law firm matter? Well, of course it does. The insurance company, they're huge with unlimited resources. And whether your case is big or small, they're built to bully you out of the money you're owed. But here's the good news. We're big too, the biggest actually. And we're built to fight to make them pay for all that was taken from you. Size is our strength. There's only one Morgan & Morgan, forthepeople.com. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on action. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. In Philadelphia, we celebrated the miracle with pride only five years ago. And then the following morning, IBEW Local 98 members went back to work, building this city, rescuing our communities from decay, and inspiring the young men and women of the region to take pride in who we are. Like the cats, Local 98 members believe in hope. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and career opportunities with Local 98, visit us, ibew98.org. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass, free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. National Football Show, Big Sills, Hollis Thomas, 4.30 Eastern Time. Come on, Kenneth. B. 
Big Sills gets a kick out of doing this shit. Come on, man. Just throwing. We're having a conversation. Hey, I'll, you know what? Maybe I need to be clear on something. I'm not loyal to anybody on that team. I'm loyal to the Eagle winning. I want the Eagles to win. I'm not loyal to any dude on that team. Why are you? Why are you? This is about winning. It's team sports. It's not individual dude sports. Do you know what I think is the number one thing that really stops teams from winning? They're afraid to make the tough cut or the tough trade because they know a community likes a guy so bad. You know what they'll do? They'll hold on to that guy like they did in Pittsburgh with Roethlisberger three years too long. Or in Miami with Marino three years too long. And they'll hold on to that guy because they're holding on to the past. And you're never progressively building your team for the future and looking on what the team looks like in two, three years. You know the salary cap? I think forces these new wave GMs to do that, make those tough cuts and get rid of guys like that. Years past, how many times do you see those old dudes on the teams? Because fans loved them. Bro, I'm not saying you shouldn't love Jason Kelsey, but if Jason Kelsey wasn't putting all pro years together like he did last year, I don't give a shit who he is. Time to go, guy. This is not a retirement home. This is about winning Super Bowls and winning championships. That's hard to tell fans that. That is so hard to tell fans. Fans can't handle that. They love their guys. They want to keep their guys. They want to see familiar faces. Instead, when the ultimate reality is this is about winning football games. Anything in team sports is like that. The Patriots, man, tough cuts, tough trades, got rid of everybody. They didn't care. Shit, they never even offered Brady a contract. Right decision? No, but it's how they work. Tape, that's right. It's business, man. Who's who's Jim Acosta? Ugh. Showtime, you're right, Dan. We don't care for Rager because he won't put the work in. Showtime. Yeah, but you know what? You would you would care about Deshaun Jackson. Even if Deshaun Jackson was out of gas, you would still care to ha- have him on the team. That's what I'm talking about. The loyalties that fans have to aging veterans sometimes gets in the way of success. Organizations know that. That's right, Seth. The NFL, man, it's a cutthroat business. They don't give a shit about loyalty, especially with the money that's being thrown around today. You know the only guy that still cares about, you know, I'm going to say this and you guys are going to hate it. There's only one guy that does that. That's Jerry Jones. He overpays for his guys. And that's why they're in salary cap hell every year. I miss the 90s. It's flag football these days. There's not a lot of hitting, that's for sure. Cox should not have re-signed. He's... Jay, there's a great example. And, dude, guys, do you really want me to be Dan Cilio here right now? Do you really want me to be Dan Cilio? You should never have re-signed Fletcher Cox at 14-4. That's a dumb move. That guy ain't a $14 million player. But they were predetermined to get Jordan Davis. And so, like, they're paying $14 million for him to be an on-field coach at Tracy Rocker, I guess. That's what that is. Fletcher's not going to put those kind of numbers up. It's over. Fletcher may have a really good year. That's not 14. 14 can I tell you what 14-4 is? 14-4 is 10 sacks. Um, eight sacks, 10 sacks, 10 TFLs. Being a monster in the middle like he was five years ago. 14-4. Are you crazy? It, it was like a commemorative. 
retirement pay. It, it was like your, your, your settlement pay. Here, here's 14 4 for being a really good dude. They'll never do that in New England. Give a guy $14.4 million because they liked him. Still scratching my head on the Barnett. Maniac. That's the story of my career. That's the story of my career right there, man. Thank you, brother. That's that. It's it. Can you imagine? Get this. Can you imagine anybody other than me saying that publicly in Philly? No way on the planet you should have given 14. Hey, by the way, I'm not saying he shouldn't have come back. I'm saying not at that price tag. 14-4? <laughs> crazy. The franchise tag is 15. That means he's elite still. He's not. He hasn't been elite in three years. His contract, they can cut him easy. Hey. Just saying, 14-4. Not happening. Giving Barnett 10 million makes no sense. There's another one. You're new around here. I'm keeping Cox for 14 for the <laughs> for the young players. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm new around here. I'm not new to the league. Not new to the league. That doesn't go on in New England. They got rid of Richard Seymour, and Richard Seymour was still a Pro Bowl player when they moved him. But they wanted to get draft choices for him for the Raiders, and they moved him. My point is, once again, it's not so much that Fletcher <laughs> – that's the point. New around here, 4.4. That ain't working. Oh, he was kept here to coach. I thought that was Rocker's job. Oh, front office doing the work again. I see. Yeah, it'd be good to have him around. 14.4 million. Who in their right mind thinks that way? <laughs> it's not winning football. And now you're letting um, Hardgrave go into his final year of his contract, and they'll probably not offer him. You could be basically, at the end of the year, lose both guys. Or they franchise tag Hardgrave. If Hardgrave has a 10-sack season, they'll cut Fletcher and they'll franchise Hardgrave. He's 12-9, man. What is he, 29, 28? I'm going to let a fuck premier defensive tackle roll out of the building like that. Hey, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to let a 35-year-old guy roll out, roll out of the building. I'm not going to let a 30-year-old guy roll out. Hey, then you have Hardgrave and you have Jordan on a rookie contract. You cut your defensive tackle salaries down from thirty million to sixteen million. If Hardgrave can stay healthy, Hardgrave, Williams, and Davis, that's your future. That's gonna be the future right there. That's your future three man rotation at DT. Right there. Right? Sweat and Reddick on your ends. There's your there's your rotation. By the way, this is no shade on Fletcher. Adami Kinsu went through the same process. He was a star player in Detroit for a decade. They were not going to pay him the giant money in Detroit. So what did he do? He went to the Dolphins 
and made $20 million a year in Miami. Played down there, and you want to hear something? The Dolphin defensive run defense got worse when he was there. They blew that out. He goes to the Rams, wins the soup. No, not wins the Super Bowl, but wins. I think he gets to a Super Bowl with the Rams. Plays great for Wade. Then he goes to Tampa. Fletcher's going to be on the same train that Adami Kitsu was on. What do you think he's going to retire an Eagle? He may. Just, he may just say, look, I don't want to play anymore. I doubt it. And he'll go around collecting bags of money. That's what today's NFL is, friends. Guys don't retire in one place. That's unheard of what Kelsey's going to do. That right there is truth and reality of how the NFL works in front offices that are successful on a year-to-year basis. And by the way, to give Howie credit, Howie has been successful. There's been some swings in the one-loss column which have been dramatic. You go from winning 13 games to winning four in four years, that's a problem. That's because you couldn't figure out the quarterback position. And then you turn around and fire your coach. Hey, as much things and as much as they have worked this offseason, look at the hole they had to dig themselves out of. The 4 11 and one season. You know, I think everybody is so happy right now where Philly is because of the holes that they've dug themselves out of. Well, they... Some of those were self-inflicted. Age is undefeated, Ronald. Unless it's Tom Brady. <laughs> Flex, I don't think Fletcher underachieved in his career. I think Fletcher Cox has been an absolute fabulous football player. Was he Aaron Donald? No, but he was second to Donald for many years. And I said that to Xander a couple of years ago even. And he knows, Xander knows, I am a Fletcher Cox fan. I think he's had an absolutely outstanding career. I would say this to you. Vince Wolfork and him, I don't know. You could flip a coin and I'd be happy with both of them guys. Fletcher may be actually a better pass rusher than Vince. Vince going to Hall of Fame, by the way. Wolfork's going to the Hall of Fame. Three Super Bowl rings. One of the mainstays on that defense up there during that whole run. Let's go to Hall of Fame. Seth, he didn't. He wasn't on that Rams team that went to the um, Super Bowl against the uh, Patriots. No, you're right. I think he was already in. I think he was already in Tampa. Okay. Okay. I know his first year in Detroit, he had 10 sacks. I couldn't believe it for an interior D lineman like that to get 10 sacks. That's what makes what Donald and guys like Sapp getting these 16 and 18 sack seasons is ridiculous. I mean, interior D lineman don't get 10, 12, 14, 22 sacks. <laughs> it's not common. Okay. If you I mean back in the day, if you had a 10 sack defensive tackle, I mean, he was the best in the game. Now you're seeing guys with 11 and mm, those are, I mean, Aaron Donald, from where he rushes with all that traffic inside, I mean, remember something, Aaron Donald rushing the passer, he's got the guard and center most of the time. And if he lines up in a three technique, he's got the tackle, the guard and the center sometimes, and they keep maybe a back end on him. And he still gets to the quarterback or makes TFLs. He, I mean, he he really, really was a good. Yeah, the, the kid in Tampa is fantastic too, Chris. That's right. Jeremiah, and again, like I said, I thought Fletcher was always the second best defensive tackle to Aaron Donald. And I actually like Fletcher's game more because Fletcher was more of a run-stopping defensive tackle. I, 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 Donald is, he, he's really a great pass rusher. I mean, a great pass rusher. But as people would say, you know, I talked to Warren Sapp about this numerous times. You know, NFL is different today. 
you know, you don't really have to play a lot of run defense today. That's not what they're taught to, taught to do. Double O says Jordan Davis gets two sacks in his first game. Boy, uh, Jerome Brown, Donald, no. 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 As much as I love Jerome, and you know that. Okay? Jerome was like Fletcher. Little better pass rusher than Fletcher. Jerome, Jer- Jerome's better like he, – he, he's a better version of Chris Jones in Kansas City. Okay, Jerome was 300. Fletch, you got to understand something about Aaron Donald. He's six foot one, tops, 270. Jerome was six foot two and a half, and he was 320 pounds. I mean, Jerome had leverage and size and quickness. And he was he, – Cortez Kennedy was a great player. Cortez is a little better than Fletcher. Joe Green's the best defensive tackle, in my opinion, to ever play in National Football League, Susan. He's the best, the most intimidating, the most demonstrative, played on the best defensive line in history, most productive, most winningest, the leader of that Steel Curtain team. Joe Green is a monster. When you talk defensive tackle, you know, I know they talk Aaron Donald. It starts with Joe Green. Just an absolute intimidator. Seal Curtin, man. Just too good. Phillips says Cox 57 sacks, or two touchdowns, only get <clears throat> an older. This is not the Benjamin Button effect. Hey, 57 sacks for a defensive tackle interior. How many years has Fletcher played? It's got to be over a decade, right? 57 for an interior guy, not horrible. It's not horrible. Not horrible. Seth says, I love Donald, but Jerome and Reggie are better than him by your humble opinion. That tandem, Jerome and Reggie, I'm trying to think of it. You know, Page and Alan Page and um, Carl Eller. We're pretty awesome too, okay. We're, we're we're pretty awesome. It's going to be interesting how they're going to how they're going to move this around and how they're going to play these guys. Because, like I told you, you got thirty million dollars and two defensive tackles lined up here, okay. Fletcher's making fourteen four. Hardgrave on the other end is making twelve nine. Then you got a rookie in the room here. What's that rotation going to look like? What impact do you think he has on the defense? Let's get to our friend, Eagle legend, Hollis Thomas, and let's ask him that question here because when he rolled into Philadelphia, they probably had a plan on how they were going to use him too. Hollis, I appreciate you doing this. Thank you, my friend. How's it going? What's good, bro? Chilling, man. How you feeling? Oh, good, man. Hey, Hit on a little bit what I was saying there about how you think they're going to roll out Jordan Davis here and how you think they're going to play in this season. Well, if you, um, as you know, with any quality uh, defensive unit, there's a nice ta- defensive tackle rotation because we, we're not built like the smaller guys who could go all game long. So you got to have a guy who you trust to go in there for 15 to 20 plays at, at each side. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to balance out. But in the end, when, the, when it's nut cutting time, it actually depends on who's who's been making the most plays that that particular game on who they're gonna go with. So if the if the kid Jordan Davis comes in and shows promise, I'm pretty sure they don't have a problem with scooting one of those other guys out of the way, preferably the one who who's on, who's on a, uh, only got one year left on a deal, and you know and, and showing showing what's up. But they're gonna give him every opportunity to play, and if he and if he if he does as good as it, as, as we want him to do, he's gonna get a lot of playing time. So it's like, um, like for instance, I wouldn't, I wouldn't draft it, but when I start playing, I play like fifteen or 20, 20 snaps per game. That's what is like. That's what they started me out with. Then uh, um, later on in the season, they um, I, my snaps started to go up, 25, 25 to thirty. And then one game, it was a game here. We played against Washington Redskins here. It was the Redskins at the time. D 
deepest apologies, Commander. You know, <laughs> but, what's up? Um, and Ray Rose is walking by me uh, with the little, uh, the little ammonia caps, <laughs> smelling them. He's like, he's like I'm, th- I'm thinking about starting you today. You think you think you're ready for that? He's like, if I don't start you, you're gonna get sta- you're gonna get snaps like a starter. And I was like, I'm you know I'm ready. That that game I got like 50 plus snaps. Stellar game. We ended up winning. I think I had a, I had a sack it like four or five tackles, but that's a, that's all in the past. But I ended up starting. yeah. But wait a minute, Hollis. So your yeah. rookie year, you got to start. Yeah, I started the uh, game in uh in uh my first starting game was against Jake the Snake out in Arizona versus the Arizona Cardinals. That's awesome. Hey, when did you know? And how did you you did you start to feel while that season was going on? Because I'm going to be looking at Jordan Davis and his what production. Is, did you what, feel as the season went on? I, I I should be getting more playing time here because I'm making more plays. Or did they just come to you and it was a shocker? Or did you know that you were going to start seeing more significant playing time? Well, well, what I do know is uh, when you make your plays. They're going to get you some more plays. So they're going to get you some more opportunities to make more plays. So what I did, I played from the first, from the opening. My first, first game was that opening season at RFK Stadium. I had three I had three tackles on 15 plays. Wow. <laughs> and the, the final tackle was a tackle to stop Brian Mitchell from getting the first <laughs> down so they had to punt. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but to, to what you're saying, the way that he gets more playing time is making plays. If you don't, if you go in there and you don't know what you're doing, you're not making plays. You look lost. That's gonna you, you're gonna get some playing time, but it's not gonna be the playing time that you would like to garner like you're used to, and, and you're accustomed to. So you gotta see, you gotta seize the second each each and every time you in there, especially as a backup. You gotta show them that you that you know what you're doing and you're always ready. So as the play as um, the season start progressing. They start getting more and more confident confidence in you because that's what it pretty much is. It's like you they had to get the confidence in you, the confidence in you. And not only do the coaches get the confidence in you, the players get the confidence in you as well. Cause it was, it was some games where I, I was tired and we was on rotation. And I, I tried to come out the game one time. And uh, and William Fuller was like, he said, Hey, they're gonna send that dumb dude in here. You, he said, You just just fight it out. Fight it out. Like, hey. <laughs> it, it, it didn't resonate to me until now. Or, or, or what people are saying that is how, how they like to play with certain people, and how sometimes they just send people out there, and you know, c- because they don't want to be wrong. Do you believe that they should have brought Fletcher Cox back at fourteen point four million dollars? Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, why would he take a pay cut? Is he going to take any less snaps? A lot of people, a lot of people go into uh, into, into everybody's money. It's like, but it's like if you're not going to play me any less. Are you going to ask me to do the same job that you've been paying me for? I want I want the same amount of money. Why should I take less? We could and we could and if you want to be an asshole about it, you could go down the list and pick the motherfuckers out that's not doing their job. And, and you say you didn't ask them to take a pay cut. You didn't ask them to take a pay cut. You didn't ask them to take a pay cut. But we don't. But see, then then you're in a pissing contest. It's like so. Don't ask me to take a pay cut if you're not going to if you're not going to lessen the load. So we still expect Fletcher to be the man. We still expect him to be the man for one more year at least, but it's like, but to bring him back here on, on something lesser, you you're going to get less, and it was going to it's good. You feel unappreciated. I mean, I, I'm sure you've been you've been in that situation. It's, you've been in a situation where they bring you in and say and say, hey, we we need you to take a pay cut. Well, you pay you paying this motherfucker right here. The to- to- we call him toast. We call him toast. You, you did you ask him to take a pay cut? Well, why <laughs> why is he in here? It's like so. Don't don't give me that don't give me that crap because when people bring up somebody's pay, it's like you could. The reason why you're able to talk about those people is because of what they pay them. That's no, the, the reason so, I I brought the money up was because he is taking a four million dollar pay cut, and I was just asking how you think that. Well, no, it's not a, it's not a pay cut. It gets, it From gets, eighteen to fourteen. That that was his cap number was eighteen. His salary is going to be fourteen. He's still getting the he's still getting the money, but his okay. cap number is no longer the, the same thing. So you got to look at it in, in those terms. Okay. They, so it's like when he, I don't think he took a pay cut, but hell no, he didn't take a pay cut. Because if they still, you still got to prorate his uh, signing bonus. So, but let it, me I, throw I, this I, at you here. Hardgrave is going into his final year and he's not been offered a contract extension. Right. If you're the Eagles, do you offer him a contract extension before camp or do you let it play out? 
No, you let Hargrove, you let Hargrove, let Hargrove make you offer him a contract. You made him make you offer your contract. You go out, go out and show me what you showed me last year. Show me that wasn't a flash in the pan. Show me some consistency. That's see the difference between uh, uh, starters and backup players is consistency. See, so he could have just did that last year to try to do what you're saying. Get them, uh, hey, we maybe we need to sign them again. And then he goes and pins down his leg and it has a crappy year. Make them, you make them pay you. That's what you do. You have to make them pay you. If you come out and kick an ass like he was doing last year, you know, about October, be like, hey, we need to sign this guy. We need to sign this guy out for another two or three years. I was like, but uh, right now you don't have to do not, you don't have to do anything. He shouldn't even be worried about that. So you, if as a player for you, would you mm-hmm. feel disrespected if I didn't have a contract going into September? Would you want to play that out though, Hollis? Because the again, thing, if you thing, have that little, big it's, year, it's a little different. You, you can put yourself on the open market. But it's a, it's a it's a little different now. So see the thing is, is sometimes when you come the, the contract disputes I the contracts I had, you out uh, going into the September, it would be disrespectful because they was paying you paying you crappy. It's like so the what you would do is like you come out and you make them pay you. But then it's like they always talk about buyers beware. But what if you come out just like you said and kick teeth in? You should have you should have paid attention when I was asking you to sign this contract, and it may have been about five to ten million less. Now that I've come and set the world on fire a bit, now you want to have it's not no you I don't it's like you betting on yourself. It's like it, he's not being underpaid currently, so he really does any and, he, and he's I mean he's not being underpaid. No, he's twelve nine right now. I mean, yeah. it's I like mean, it's like if you if he was being underpaid, I can see. But he's not being underpaid, and I and if you just want some stability, if that's what you're worried about, create it for yourself. Create it yourself. Milton Williams's role for this team will be what this year? Uh, he'll be. I think he'll be a, a bit of a swing man, kind of like he was last year. He was uh, more like um, he played D tackle and he played. You D-tackle. see talent in him? Uh, yeah, I see talent in him. I see a little bit more talent in him, and I, I think it's more the, the coaching and him, him, him becoming mature. It'll be. It'll be. I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm hoping to see him mature a lot more and to, and the more de, a more defining role get himself a more defining role. Because last year they put, played him at end, but they played him at tackle. They played him at end. They played him at tackle. But is is that going to be your uh, entire career, or are you going to get that defining role to where they talk about you in the same sense as they talk about uh, Davis, Hargrove, and uh, and uh, and Fletch? Like you, you have to make you have to make the call. Hollis, the type of talent that they have on the team, especially in the front seven, is it more conducive to a 43-34? Um, how do you see them utilizing all this talent? Because this has got to be the most talent that they've had. Or I would say this. I don't know, talent. How about depth that yeah. they've had since 17? What's this? What's it more set up for? Because, look, I personally, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I mm-hmm. don't think they're that deep at linebacker. Right. They're stronger in their fronts. So yeah. how do you how how do you see them utilizing this? Well, give, given the way given the way that they've been deploying things, I, I kind of see it eventually. Like at some points during the season, they're going to have all three of those D tackles out there over the middle three, and you're going to have a you had the uh, DNs or the outside linebackers lined up over the edge and running like a, a, a true fifty or fifty or a six two front, like where they where you know where they're just taking everything away. But it's, it's set up for a four three, a good four three. And it's like you, you can't do anything else. And a and a bear or a cut front, which the offensive line called a Navajo front, uh, just you know, covering up the center because most of the time the center is the weakest link. So you, you want to cover him up and you know, make his reads and stuff hard. But given the talent we got, and I, I like the linebacker, I like, the linebacker core got a little bit stronger this year. Nicobe Dean coming in, you also still had Sean Bradley, TJ Edwards, a second year in, and the, and the kid, uh, and uh, Kaiser White. And, Kaiser White, Avery, uh, dude, it's like it's, it's, they put competition, that true competition at the linebacker position. We're not just sifting through the uh, strong safeties of the of the of college football anymore to try to find a to try to make him into a linebacker. And you know, it's like that's pretty much what we've been doing. We we had Alex Singleton, who was a great special teams player, the leading tackler, but most of them was six or seven yards downfield. We need we need guys who are difference makers who are going to uh, on third and long. That we don't have to run, we don't have to rush three and drop eight, and then we still give up third and fifteen. Derek yeah. Barnett's role, in your opinion, saw so much talent out of him in college, and it's just not panned out. 
at the next level. And right. for whatever reason, Hollis, do you th- do you think there's a role on that defense for him, or do you think that they've already made their mind up on him? Well, they brought they brought him back, so obviously they think some of him. But I, I think he's going to be on a bit of a, a short leash, given his not not for talent, but for the bonehead penalties. It's like when you it's like when the coach said I I, I knew it was him. When the coach says that that type of stuff that he knew who the penalty was against, you, you your days are kind of numbered. It's like you can't, especially the fifteen yarders and their senseless penalties. Penalties you you could you could just it was. Let me give you. I mean, let me slow down here. Let me give you a scenario where he it was a senseless penalty. We even made the guy fumble. We played against Tampa Bay. All the way downfield, play is over. They fought, they have they, they have fumbled. Was gonna have to use a timeout to see was it really a fumble. But guess who pushed somebody in the back? As the play, the whistle blowing right in front of the referee. Bam! Unnecessary, unnecessary roughness. You already got you already got the moniker of being a dirty player. You know, Hollis, what- is that the stuff you're talking about when they said that they trusted you, that you wouldn't be doing plays like that? That that's the kind of stuff, along with success and putting mm-hmm. production up, that's the stuff you're talking about and why you're saying a short leash because there's a trust factor here right. and a production factor here right. with him. Yeah, right. The, the trust factor is, is he going to do something stupid? He's going to hit the quarterback late. Is he going to go? Is he going to hit the quarter hands to the face or something? It's like when you have I I had two penalties literally in my entire career, two, which two, is a ten two. plus career. Yeah, it's, it's 14, 15 years, you know. But who's counting? But I, I had two, <laughs> and it was like one of one of them was I jumped off sides from trying to jump the count. The other one, the other one was putting all of my body weight, which I won't even call that a penalty. Put all of my body weight on uh, Jake uh, Jake Plummer. Uh, on my first start, so when I sacked him, I, I scooped, I scooped and slammed him, like you know, <laughs> lock, lift, and drive. It's like it's a text, textbook tackle at any other time. It's like, but he's putting all of his weight on the quarterback. What the hell was I supposed to put it at? It's like, scooped <laughs> and slammed. <laughs> it's like, but if, if you ever can find it, it was like, uh, I was like ninety. Uh, oh, 96. hey, that's my favorite line. I <laughs> scooped and slammed his ass. I <laughs> <laughs> but if you, but but truly, if uh, I think it's, uh, I was able to go see the practice too. Uh, the practice is running a lot smoother than they were in the last year. Uh, now I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a type of guy. It's like I'm I'm still waiting to see them in pads uh, versus another team. I was like, but uh, it's night and day compared to when I seen them when they first got started. Because remember when they first got started, they couldn't really do as much as they they're doing now. Yeah, but Paulus, I got to stop you. I got to ask you this. And to me, I've had a okay. massive ass with this. Okay. This practicing of – this week was supposed to be mandatory OTAs. Now, I know. Look, now, now, look, I get helmets and shorts. I'm not going to wake out about it. But last week, they're supposed to have six days and two days. I mean, six days OTAs. They right. end up having three. They can it. They're, you know they're going to do the same process in training camp, or they're going to break camp early. My question to you is this. The reason they got out to a two and five start last year was because of bonehead defenses and offensive <laughs> game plan. And on top of that, you weren't ready because you didn't practice. Those Phil Sims said this, Hollis. He goes, mm-hmm. There's a difference between those organized practices with other teams and right. quality reps when you get into the exhibition games. Yes, it's exhibition, yeah, but those are higher quality reps yeah. than you they're get. High, and your take quality. on this, yeah, your take on quality. how the Eagles are going about it. And the, the high quality reps is, is, is true because you get well. I, I, I like the in, in, in team practice, not uh, when you practice against another team because the competition level goes up a little bit. I was like, but it's nothing you could beat about you, nothing you could beat with live action, live action, and, and, and you know you got the true referees out there and everything is happening. It's nothing to is you can't even you can't imitate that. That's why when when, say, when people say that people oh he's doing good in practice. It's like, yeah, but that's his teammate. He's not trying to maim him. It's like so, uh, and, and I'm I'm kind of with you uh, uh, to a certain extent. Like, I like what they're what they're what they're doing now a little bit. It's like because we would have played for eons if they did uh, did that with us. We would probably just be quitting right now. <laughs> but, no doubt, two a days, three a days sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so it's like with that with what they're doing now. I, I still think it leads it leads to a more of those soft tissue injuries. A soft, a soft tissue injuries at the beginning of the season, but the thing, but the thing with um with the birds this year is 
they had a chance to meet with everybody. They have had, had chances to uh, put their stuff in. So they've been they've been doing stuff with OTAs, and it's not like uh, it's not like like last year they couldn't do really nothing. So they've been had they've been had they had their stuff together. I don't think, I expect them. I expect to see a faster start than I did last year. It's like me, I expected I, I expected to be a lot a lot better, and that's what I saw when I saw them saw them doing their, their little practices and stuff. You know you, you know when a new coach gets there, everybody is is in that mode of. You know, oh, am I supposed to be over here? Or am yeah, I supposed yeah. to be over there? And, yeah, and every, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a bit of hesitation. He who hesitates masturbates. It's like it's one of those one of those moments where uh you can see everybody knew where to be and how to do it. Where to be and how to do it, where to be and how to do it. The only th- the only reservation I have is uh, how are we gonna deploy this defense? Are we are we gonna be a true number ten defense, uh, a top ten defense where we attack and, and people are scared of us? Are we gonna come out with this bitch made crap that we we was doing last year with uh, with sloughing and stuff and standing at the sticks and not doing anything and having full rush and everybody knows? And put it this way, Tom Brady said he knew that in the <laughs> I heard him on the sideline during a playoff game. They're doing the exact same blank shit that they did to us in the regular season game. We're gonna kill them. That's what he said on the sideline. I'm like, I'm like, I was. Pissed. Hey, Hollis, I heard Troy Aikman going like this. He was going like this. Throw the ball to the left. Throw the ball to the left. Throw mm-hmm. the ball to the left. So that leads me to this. Then, do you think the coaches? Hey, if one thing, the players have to up their game with experience. Mm-hmm. Are you expecting the coaching staff to be better this year, defensively and offensively, with Sirianni and Gannon? I'm not. I'm expecting. I'm expecting Gannon to be ten times better. The offense came along last year. And they helped the defense out a lot. A lot of those long drives and stuff. And the thing that I loved of what Sirianni did, he didn't do that crap that everybody else does. And they think that, oh, I'm going to fool him on this play. No, we're going to run this ball down your throat. You can't stop it. How many times have you been in a game and they've been running the ball down your throat? You try to stop them. It's like, please throw a pass. Just it's over. Please. <laughs> <laughs> because not, nothing demoralizes the defense because everybody gets in there. After they ran the ball down your throat, and it's the sixth play of the drive, and everybody's in there huffing and puffing, talking about you wonder what they're going to do this next play. The hell you think they're going to do? Hey, Hollis, I tell people this all the time. PBO coming right at you. Hey, when a team runs the ball for 200 yards on you, man, it's like having one hand tied behind your back, and there's nothing you can do about it, man. I mean, if a power team kills you like that, it's over. Yeah, and it, it's like a lot of people, because I was laughing because everybody was talking about something. You throw to run the ball. No, you run to throw the ball. Because once you get those horses up front tired, there will not be a pass rush, and you can pick the secondary apart. And you the play the play action fakes, oh, my God. They're going to be so, be so deadly. After you get, 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 get bludgeoned up and down the field, and they've been doing what they wanted, when they wanted, they've been dictating the game to you. Man. And, but people, but people always want to pass. They always want to look pretty. As soon as they miss pass, you always see the receiver like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish you looking for a penalty. Go after the rock. You know? <laughs> hey, too much hype on this team. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't like the fact that every like last year, everybody was uh, acting like chumps and stuff. Called saying we was going to win four, four games. Uh, I, I distinctly said nine or ten games, and we was going to get our ass kicked in the first round of the playoffs. That was that was, that was that was my distinct prediction, and I was like, I'm expecting, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not expecting leaps and bounds. I'm expecting them them to take a step up by winning a playoff game and, and making some noise and putting everybody on notice. And I, I think that and, and watching them and, and watching how they work, I don't think I don't think they're not paying attention. I don't think they're going to eat the cheese. Okay, well, I'm gonna tell you something. I thought that when you were on last, I thought you were crazy when you said one thing. What's that? That's something about Andy Reid. And then get this. Mm-hmm. Tyree Kill comes out three weeks later. Hang on. It goes like this. You know what, man? They just weren't being truthful with me. They never offered me a contract. And he goes, they were telling me one thing and doing another. And he kept saying how much this and that. And then every time I went to the guy, the guy kept going. Reid hasn't gotten back to me. And before you know it, I was out the door. And I went, shit, man, this is almost the same shit that Thomas, <laughs> Thomas told me, man. They, they, they ran him around the room. I know. And they ran him out of the building the same yeah. way. So you were dead on, man. I apologize. You were you well, were dead was, right with this. I was not. Well, see, if, uh, my, you, know, you thank Carla Virginia, Carla Virginia. That's my mom. She, 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 she never trusted him. 
And it took me until he played me close uh, to what, what, uh, when they traded right before they traded the year before they traded me to the Saints. It took me until he played me close then to uh, to realize what she was talking about. Moms are always right. <laughs> <laughs> um, she called him a snake in the grass, and that's what you know. I, I will stick with that. Like everybody's, as I think he's, a, I think he's a Hall of Fame coach, uh, but I don't think he, I don't think he makes it to the Super Bowl or or wins it without the enemy calling the plays offensively. I don't care what nobody says. He's a good planner, and he's a good he, he's a good planner. And he, if you uh, give him an opportunity to be prepared, he will. He can't prepare a team to be a winner as long as you give him the defense first. I'm going to ask you one last question. This is about Jack Del Rio in the locker room of the Washington Commanders. No, brother. <laughs> is it get, get this, Hollis? People have their own personal opinions on things. Yeah. But I said this the other day. When you're in an NFL locker room. You don't have freedom of speech. What you have <laughs> is you have to remember things that are said in that locker room and right. you start pissing people off and bringing outside noise into the building. Right. That's where I think, look, I don't care what Jack thinks. It's not my life, but right. don't bring it in the locker room because that right. means other players have to start answering those questions exactly. and you're not going to get the response that you want to hear. Just mm-hmm. your take. That was my take. He should have yeah. shut it home. Well, my take, my take was uh, I didn't know he was that stupid because he called it. He called up up the thing that happened at the White House where seven people died a dust up. Um, I don't. Is and given given who you're trying to coach, um, trying to co- coach a, bro- a bunch of young brothers, uh, and for you to have the, uh, I'm gonna call it. They call that's what they call white privilege. It's like he think and he still. I think he still thinks that he was correct in what he said. But you're earning your keep off of some of the same young men who have that fear every time we see the raspberries and blueberries in the in in, the, in our rearview mirror. I was like, for you to say that about a man who who di- who died, an unarmed man who died, versus some people who actually, dude, we're talking about the Capitol. You start talking. Let, let's let's cut let's cut the shit. We talk. We are talking about the Capitol. Motherfuckers stormed the Capitol. You talking about people personally prop, personal property? We're talking about our capital, our nation's capital, got stormed, and you had people. I was like, and you call it a dust up, but to what you're saying, that's the type of shit you keep to yourself. That's why they say you keep your politics and your religion to yourself. I was like, because I can have a disagreement with you, I have no problem with having a disagreement with you, but when you come and you're that wrong, I I, I don't I don't give a damn about it. it's right and wrong, and right is right and wrong is wrong. Neither, neither one of the situations that he's speaking about was was right. Like the, it's, we, there shouldn't have been any uh, messing up with any property and stuff, and that, there shouldn't have been none of that should have happened. I was like, but to call the thing at the at the you, you, the nation's capital a dust up that that was the dumbest thing in the world. But to post it, what the hell are you you po- you're tweeting it, and it's, I, it goes I, to the <laughs> other part of what you're saying. You hey got man, all our business in the street. Yeah, it's I, like put it this way. I, it's cool for me to know that you that you're a fucking idiot. I was like, but if everybody else knows, how can I defend that? I cannot defend that in public. But I can defend if you shut the fuck up. If you shut the fuck up and we and we and we know we're not, oh he's just, he's crazy. That's not, that's that's our family, but he's crazy. But for everybody else to know how crazy you are and to the magnitude, I, it's like I can't defend that. It's like yeah. there's no way on God's green earth. Any anybody who they who they ask who they ask uh, uh about that situation are probably gonna disdain from comp. Uh, comments uh, on it because they're with the organization, and that, and I think Ron feels like he he rectified it, but it's gonna be it's gonna be rough it's gonna be rough for Jack Del Rio for a hot second until it, he needs to. I'm not gonna even say what he needs to do, but if I made that that type of statement, if, if it was the way I felt, I would I would come out and apologize to anybody I offended, because it's it's like because if he feels that way and he truly feels that way, who am I to say uh, you know how how he's supposed to feel. No, no, he, he apologized, Hollis. He apologized to everybody in the in the room. And so f- what Ron and everyone are saying and the teammates are saying is that it was received well and he apologized. But like you said, we shall see. Hollis, I got a roll. <laughs> Thank know. you so Let's much. Go. Always fun kicking it around with you, my friend. Please, uh, yeah, I, I hope um, we get to do it again. Yeah, just let, uh, let me know. I'm, all, I'm always around. Um, actually, I'm doing Ron Jaworski's. Uh, uh, he's having a party on Thursday night. You know, the, Fantastic. You know the, like, yeah, it's like uh, he, he does a golf tournament every year. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, Tell Jaws I said hi. Okay, cool, cool. Thank I, you, I, Hollis. I, I appreciate I, I, it. I, I, that I, I, is I, I, Hollis Thomas, right. man. I love 
talking some ball with him, man. That was really salty and really good. We really appreciate it. Guys, please hit the like button. Don't forget Morgan and Morgan, where the fee is free. Choosing that attorney is one of the most important things if you're hurt or injured on the job. For the people, my friends, this is not a slogan. Morgan and Morgan lives by this line here, okay? For the people. Last 30 years, they've collected over $13.5 billion worth of compensation settlements for their clients. Over 800 strong attorneys and offices in Philadelphia, New York, and Florida. They're there to do battle for you. They're the biggest law firm in the country, and they will be ready for you. No such thing as a fender bender. Look, the call is free. 800-512-1600. That's 800-512-1600. Look, 24-7, seven days a week. And when you call Morgan & Morgan, do me a favor. Tell them Big Sill sent you. After a car crash, the big insurance companies you see advertising on TV, they may try to downplay your case and might say it's only a fender bender or it's just a herniated disc. I worry that some law firms fall for this BS, not us. We put ourselves in your shoes and ask, what would it be like to be in your pain for the rest of our lives? A million dollars wouldn't be enough for me. There's only one Morgan & Morgan for the people.com. Go for the pulls and the pools. Go for the oohs and the ahs. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass. Free. You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. All right, did you know I was the mommy slam dunk champion? Really? <laughs> yes, really, don't sound so surprised. Let's see it. Oh, you're ready. All right, here we go. Let's hear the crowd. So go to right, I go to look, fake a mama. Mama, go. Oh, mama! She did it. Again, you can't avoid gravity, but United Healthcare can help you avoid financial surprises by helping you compare costs and doctor quality ratings. United Healthcare. Uh huh. Go for the midnight tears. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Welcome back. Big Still National Football Show. Appreciate you guys coming in. Please hit the like button. Thank you so much. Look, when I brought that topic up to Hollis, I was more so talking about the locker room. I'm not going to sit here and debate what he said. But what I will say is this. That's the shit you're trying to not have in your locker room. That's the kind of debate you don't want to talk about. That's the distraction that Jack's fault is at. 
Don't bring unwanted conversation into your locker room. There's a task at hand. I don't want to talk about this topic. I don't want to talk. You see some of the topics you guys are talking about? I'm not bringing them up. That's not what I want in my locker room. That's Del Rio's mistake. Is what some of you are... To, do you see... You guys... Xander, this is the greatest example of a locker room. Is the chat room. There's no difference from the chat room to a locker room. No difference. Zero. And some of the stuff you guys are talking about is counterproductive to winning. It has no bearing. Now, if we were in a political conversation and I was running for Congress or I'm running for a political seat, there's a different, there's a different narrative then. I'm trying to win a ball game. I'm trying to get trust in my locker room with my players that the defensive scheme that I'm putting together here, we're all going to be on the same page. Ronald, religion too. No, no, 007. No, no reason to be. It's all good. You guys made the example of what I was saying to Hollis by some of your comments. Some of you guys probably didn't like some of the things that Hollis said about that situation. That's exactly what I'm talking about. This match was lit by Jack Del Rio. And in an organization that doesn't need that, that's one thing I'm really proud of the Eagles this year. There's been no shit stories. There's been no stories of, like, there was a couple years ago between Wentz and Doug Peterson and Howie and all that. All that stuff's gone. That's a different form of conversation and a different form of noise in a locker room than what we were talking about with Del Rio in the commander's locker room. But noise is noise. Why do you think people don't want Kaepernick in the league? It's not because Colin, no one wants to debate the story anymore. I don't want it in my room. I want to talk football. We're here. This is a professional football locker room. It is not a city hall. It is not a town hall on CNN or Fox. This is an NFL locker room and our task at one thing. I tell you guys this all the time. And my wife says it too, dude, your political beliefs, no one gives a shit. They barely care about your sports, your sports takes. Marcos. And by the way, so, you know, you can have those political beliefs either side of the aisle. It's okay. You have every right in this country to believe any way you feel. It's what makes our country spectacular. But what you don't have a right to do is to jump into my locker room and start barking that shit. It'd be like somebody going into your place of business and start having a political rally for a particular candidate and you don't support that candidate. I wouldn't want that in my building. I wouldn't. And then Del Rio has to go around apologizing. For what? Get this. Jack Del Rio is apologizing for what? He's apologizing because of the distraction he caused. But then he's got to lie and also say, hey, I didn't mean what I said. Because that's how you get it beat out of you. It's a shame. It's on him, though. He lit himself on fire. And like Hollis said, and he took the Twitter. It's one thing to be a jerk in your locker room and say something stupid, which we all have. It's another thing to tweet it out for the world to sit there. And then, you know, Twitter. So you, Twitter, is, it's not a science. People interpret everything you write differently. <sighs> By the way, if you're an Eagle fan, you're happy what's going on in Washington. You should be cheering. You should be cheering what Del Rio's doing. Because you know why? Not that you believe or don't believe, but the more distractions for the commanders and Wentz, the better. That's funny. People always go like this. You, 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 you hope? Yeah, I hope that. I hope that Washington has 10 times more distractions. 
I don't give a shit what they want to have the scratches over. They got enough of them with their owner. That's a beautiful thing. You ever notice the quietest teams in the room are usually the most successful teams? And the Eagles have been pretty quiet, having fun, talking about a great environment, looking forward to the upcoming season. A lot of question marks. It's really awesome. And look at Washington. Wentz, how is he in the locker room? Locker room. Think about that for a minute. Wentz in the locker room, Del Rio in the locker room. Think about that. Self-inflicted wounds that Washington has brought on themselves with a quarterback they traded for, who's got locker room issues, and the defensive coordinator who just made locker room issues. It's a perfect world if you're an Eagle fan. You're, you're, you really think, hey, this will be the greatest job of coaching I've ever seen if Ron Rivera can weather this and they win. I, I, he'll be NFL coach of the year. So you bring in a guy with a locker room reputation of not being the best, and now you have a defensive coordinator that's apologizing in the locker room because he said some things that upset folks. How's that conducive to winning? How is that conducive to winning? It's not. It's counterproductive. All right. NFL draft has come out this morning with the top 10 players. Actually, they did 32. I'm not doing 32. But they do have the top five quarterbacks that are going to go into the NFL draft. I want to broach those guys a little bit. I want to reset to a little bit what I said about Pete Prisco's top 100 players. Eagle guys are ranked very low here. I want to re-hit on that. Um, anything you guys want to bring up, please hit the like button. Hour three coming up. Keep it right here on the National Football Show. Go for the polls and the pools. Go for the oohs and the ahs. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass. Free. You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. All right, did you know I was the mommy slam dunk champion? Really? <laughs> yes, really, don't sound so surprised. Let's see it. Oh, you're ready. All right, here we go. Let's hear the crowd. So go to right, I go to left, fake them up. Mama, go up, up, up. She did it. Again. You can't avoid gravity, but United Healthcare can help you avoid financial surprises by helping you compare costs and doctor quality ratings. United Healthcare. Uh huh. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com.
Hour three, National Football Show with your boy, Big Seals. Please hit the like button. Thank you guys so much for coming aboard. Uh, before I move on here, I do want to say something about Steph Curry. And uh, they grabbed a 3-2 lead in the NBA Finals last night versus the Celtics. You ever notice how certain sports talk people, they find whipping boys. No matter the success that they have, they like gravitate to these guys because they make livings off of their failures. Skip Bayless is the greatest example of this. This guy made a 25-year career or a 20-year career over ripping on LeBron James. And now he's moved on to Steph, who's on the brink of winning his fourth NBA championship. I've never done that. I don't pick one player. You know, I've had my comments about LeBron. But you'd be an idiot if you think that LeBron James is not one of the top three players in the history of the sport. Okay, Jabbar, Jordan, and him. Those are the three best players in the history of the NBA. And you could make the argument LeBron's the only player that could play all five positions and star at it. Could make the conversation. I mean, LeBron's a billionaire while being active. He has shown people like Jordan and Bird and Magic did by selling shoes that there's more to the game that you can sell your brand. That's what's important about it. By the way, tomorrow I've got Ice Cube on. You know what Ice Cube is going to tell you? One of the reasons that he started Big 3 is because these guys had worked so hard to build their brands that all of a sudden when they retired, they just go away, some of these guys. They don't have the affordability that LeBron and Jordan and Magic Johnson or some of these other guys have built their great brands up. And so what he's done is he's taken this league and he's putting these great players in this league, giving them an opportunity to go out and make some money and have some fun and play a sport they love, which I think is great. I've never done that. Steph Curry, to me, if he wins his fourth NBA championship, he'll tie LeBron. There's even a part of me that says he may run down Jordan. What if he wins this and wins two more and he has six? And you're going to start talking about the greatest perimeter shooter in the history of the NBA with six NBA championships. What will the narrative be? He's not a clutch shooter. That's what Bayless and every, some of these other guys are saying he's not clutch. What, he scored 14 points or whatever it was last night? Jordan has done that before too. Shit, it was six years. Do you guys remember this? Okay, Six years it took Jordan to beat like the Celtics and the Pistons. Not many people realize this. Isaiah Thomas has a winning record versus Magic Johnson and Larry Bird in the NBA playoffs. How's that distinction? And no one gives Isaiah Thomas credit for it. And he never played with another superstar. He didn't play with a top 50 guy on that team ever. Wasn't a top 50 guy in those the Detroit Pistons teams that won back-to-back NBA titles. It was him. Joe Dumars was decent. Finney Johnson was good. Rodman, clearly not a top 50, one of the greatest rebounders of all time. I get it. And defenders. But they had the Rick Mahorns, the Lamb Beers. Those guys were really good players. They weren't top 50, though. Jordan played with maybe the greatest Robin of all time in Pippen. Tremendous. Those Pistons teams, I'll tell you something, Chris. The Pistons teams reminded me of the seven of the uh, Flyers teams back in the day with Bobby Clark, Broad Street Bullies. That's how they play basketball. They play basketball like Bobby Clark and Bernie Perrant's uh, Flyers. That's how I looked at it. Eastside Monster. Been sitting here like 12 minutes waiting for you all to chill. (laughs) Look what politics does. It's such a sinful thing. Politics is the worst thing in our country right now to talk about. Look at what it does. It divides sports fans. And I told you this before, guys. The one place where we're not divided is in a football stadium. Is in a football stadium. You guys just need to chill. 
all the people that think they have the answers to our political issues in this country, you guys need to chill. Follow things that make you happy. You know why we listen to the same song or watch the same movie over and over again? Because it puts us in a good frame of mind. If you're watching the news all day long, it puts you in a shitty frame of mind. I stopped watching the news a couple of years ago. I stopped it. I'm just not doing it. Make, it puts you in an angry mood. And that, like everything bugs you. Not me. Okay? Not me. You know what bugs me? The Eagles not practicing hard. <laughs> That's what bugs me. Let me throw this at you here. I'm going to pick one guy on the Eagle team to keep an eyeball on. Seals, do you like ACDC? Hey, Brian Johnson used to come on my show, brother, because he lives in Sarasota, Florida. Dude, check it out. Brian Johnson, okay, the guy who took over uh, as the lead singer for Bon Scott for ACDC when he died. And he's like a race car driver. He races at Sebring. And so he calls up. Then he comes into the studio. Hey, Sills, how you doing? I listen to you all the time. This is when I was on DAE in Tampa. Because Brian Johnson walking in the room, man. And I'm like, dude, this is so cool. Yeah. So I know the lead singer for um, – then again, I know Lars very well too. On my highlight tape, I had to get Lars to okay it on YouTube to play the music. You know that that what that uh, Xander played the mute. I got permission from Lars from Metallica. He lives in San Francisco. Yeah, man. Lars goes. Yeah, but here, what was funny about it? Lars goes like this. Hey, that's quite a highlight tape you made. Wow. I said you liked it. He goes, yeah. I also like the music "Whiskey in a Jar." Yeah, man. It's one of my favorite Metallica tunes. Is it? I said, yeah, man. It really fit the, it really fit the, um, the video. And he goes, who gave you permission to do that? And I went, uh, he goes, wait, you thought because of our friendship that it'd be okay? I went, yeah. I, I, he goes, oh, really? And so, like, I guess, like, YouTube, they, they, they weren't playing the music for a while until Lars and his company okayed it. Lars and, like, Hetfield own all the music rights to Metallica, and they watch his shit. Hey, hey, W2. <laughs> yeah, man, and, and you should have seen me. I'm going like this. Hey, don't you think Whiskey in a Jar fits the, the highlights? And he goes, Yeah. Who gave you permission? I went, well, he goes, oh, you thought our friendship that you could just put that on a five minute interview or a five minute tape. I go, yeah. He goes, really? Huh? What should I do about this? I went, ah. he goes, look here. Um, it's okay. Don't do it again. <laughs> Don't do it again. CBS called me. Oh, you know that we've had Sean McManus. He got a call from the record company going, don't the highlights. Did you okay the highlights? Sean okayed the high. I had to get the CBS people to okay the highlights. And I had to get Metallica to okay the music for that video. That's how crazy it got. I just thought we put it together. My friend put it together for me. We, we just used the video highlights and the music and it was cool. The hell did I know? I got a call from CBS and I got a call from, I think it was Electra or somebody. How's that story? Lars himself calls me, man. Hey, man. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm talking in a couple of months. What's going on, bro? I'll be up in San Fran and Biddy goes, great. We'll grab a bite. I'd like to talk to you about something now, though. I go, what? He goes, who gave you the permission to play whiskey in a jar on your highlight reel? Uh, uh, I couldn't come up with anybody because I had the guy right there. And he goes, did you tell people that I gave you permission? I go, no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. He goes, that's the only reason I'm going to let this go because you didn't do it because they said you, when you asked him, he goes, you just didn't know. 
Yeah, because I, I, I said, no, I was never going to put my friendship on the line. Yeah, I, hey, Big Chris, really? I got a really hard lesson. Hey, I got a really hard lesson, man, in business right there. Oh, my God. Friendship and business did not mix right there. Hey, Chris, they did. They would play the video, but they wouldn't play the music until Lars okayed it. <laughs> Lars okayed it himself, and that's why you could play the music now and why the music's played on it. Yeah. For like two months, the music wasn't played. Oh, man, so Lars is a spectacular guy. Called me right out on it too, man. My wife said, we're, it's like right before we eat eating dinner. I go, Lars, my wife's like, hey, tell him I said hi. And then she's hearing the conversation. She's like, you dumbass. You dumbass. You didn't ask him. He, she's saying this in the background. You didn't ask him. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Oh, Headfields. You know what? Gravy. He's really quiet in person. He doesn't really talk a lot. Pharrell and I, do you remember the album Reload? If you remember the album Reload, <laughs> did you call Morgan and Morgan? Thank you, Ron. Um, we went down and Pharrell had the bench going at the time. And I was on KMBR and I had taken over for Scott. And Scott and I are friends, dear friends. And... Hey, Gravy, check this out, though. So they premiered Reload on Pharrell's On the Bench, and we were all there, and we simulcast my show, Sports Phone 68. And so on my show and Scott Pharrell's show, um, Pharrell On the Bench, we were beaming a brand-new album out called Reload. Yeah. Yeah, remember Napster and all that? Yeah, man, I love Metallica. Those Metallica guys. Hey, Alice in Chains guys. Unfortunately, the guy passed away, the lead singer, but all those dudes knew one another. Really great guys, man. That was a great time when I was on at KMBR. It's really great. All right. Let me get back to where I was going with this. I want you guys to pick one guy that's not a frontline star on the team that you're going to keep an eye on this year. I'm going to give you my guy here in a minute. Who is the one guy that you think could have a breakout year and a guy that's kind of flying under the radar for the Eagles. Who's that one dude? By the way, I'm going to get to those, those NFL top, those top picks and quarterbacks here in a minute. Give me one Eagle guy that's flying under the radar. Marcus Epps, Jalen Rager. God, you're only hoping. Milton. Goddard. Pascal, Quez, Milton Williams. Wow, you guys haven't named my guy yet. Yeah, Rager, say thank you, Philip. Wow, you hey Philip, you fooled me. <laughs> Quez, Gainwell, Miles Sanders, Dean. Epps is going to have a lot of eyes on him. He surely is. Josh Sweat, love it. There it is. Chris? Chris to follow. Chris, do me a favor. Hit the like button, please. I'm with you. TJ Edwards. I got to tell you something about where TJ Edwards' mind has to be right now. Let me tell you this about TJ Edwards. So they drafted N'Kobe Dean to upgrade the linebacker position, right? If you're TJ Edwards going into the 2022 season, aren't you doing this right now? They just think I'm a good player. They don't think I'm exceptional. They don't think I'm anything. They just think I'm solid. They just think, what, what does Ronald say? He's steady. Man, my entire objective would be this. 
every time the Kobe Dean or anybody else steps on that field as a linebacker, I am going to outplay every single person that plays the position of linebacker on this Eagle team. And I am going to, at the end of the year, when everything is said and done, have had the best year of any player in the group. That, to me, is the guy that I love on my football team. I played like that. I had a guy next to me in Jerome Brown that was everything, and rightfully so. I saw him in a game against Oklahoma destroy a football team. I mean, I've never been on a field with a guy professionally or collegiately where a guy just destroyed a team single-handedly. 20 tackles, an interception, a sack. He broke Aikman's leg. Five tackles for losses. A block field goal. Eight TFLs. I, I, I was in, and we're, I'm looking at him going, you got to be kidding me. It was so dominating. We made T-shirts with Jerome with his pants down, taking a shit in an Oklahoma helmet, and we all wore him out. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like it. He systematically destroyed. He broke Troy Aikman. The reason Troy Aikman was a first-round draft choice is because Jerome broke his leg in Norman, and he transferred to UCLA. Then they put Jamal Holloway in, which is even more of a nightmare. Just the story. But man, you know what I wanted to do? And I did. I wanted to play Jerome, and I did. More tackles, more sacks, more tackles for losses, more solo tackles, more hits on the court. I had them all. And it made me a better player. I mean, if I can do things that he was doing, I knew that I would have a great year. He was my benchmark. So if I'm TJ Edwards and they're saying all this about N'Kobe Dean and I outplay him, what are they going to say about me? That's how you get competition. Like here, I'll give you another one. So if I'm Devontae Smith and I see AJ Brown getting all that money, do you know what I'm thinking to myself? My number one objective is to have more catches and more yardage than him and more touchdowns than him. I want to completely outplay him. Do you know what that creates? That creates competitive edge on your team. You've got this at multiple positions. If I'm Jordan Mulata and I look down the line and I see Lane Johnson and I see how everyone looks at him as an all pro and a pro bowl guy, I want to outplay him. I want to be better than him. If I'm Hardgrave, hey, I'm going to outplay Fletcher Cox as much as I possibly can. Look at all of the, hey, James Bradbury. James Bradbury has to be in the Eagle secondary doing this now. Darius Slay made the Pro Bowl last year. I'm on a one-year deal in Philly. Not only am I auditioning for the Eagles, but I'm auditioning for 31 other teams. And I'm going to go out, and every single time that I step on a field, because people said last year was a shitty year for me, and it was. Let's be real. He wasn't good last year. The year previous to that, he was a pro bowler. So he's got pro bowl capabilities. Agreed. Players can have bad years. We see it all the time, especially in bad situations. So if I'm James Bradbury, I'm, my number one job is outplay Darius Slay. There are so many great battles internally for the team. All friendly. I'm not talking about talking shit to each other. I'm talking about wanting to be as competitive as possible. Jerome and I used to fight over tackles in film after a while. I got that tackle. No, I got that tackle. Butch Davis used to go crazy because we would sit there and go, but it was competitive in a friendly way. Competitive in a friendly way. 
GT says, Sills, what do you think about Terry McLaurin not showing up to mandatory camp with the commanders? GT, it just goes down the line of what's going on with the chaos in that organization. You got a wide receiver bitching about the money that's being thrown around right now. And he sees the money. You just had a defensive coordinator act like an ass in a locker room. And you brought in a guy who's got questionable issues in the locker room with Carson Wentz. If you're an Eagle fan, like I said, you couldn't ask for a better situation. Your top wide receiver offensive skill set guy is holding out. Your coordinator's made a tool of himself. And you got a quarterback you're not sure of. What more could possibly go wrong in Washington? They haven't even played a game yet. If I am Ron Rivera, Ron, he, dude, you need to clean this up. The Washington commanders are a train wreck, and your owner's going to have to testify in Washington for an unhealthy work environment. <laughs> How do you win? How can you be competitive when shit runs downhill like that? The commanders, man, I mean, right. Name me one thing good about them that you've seen over the last two years. Now they want to get a new stadium. Of all the teams that don't deserve a new stadium, they're number one. They have sucked under the ownership of Daniel Snyder. They've not won. They've been like the Raiders of the East Coast. The Raiders are at least starting to win now. You can say whatever you want about John Gruden, but he did right the ship. Okay, he did. And the worst organization next to the Jets has been the Washington Commanders. The, the, the Commanders. Right, the name sucks even. I do dig the helmet. Okay. Which, hey, King, it, it's, it's an awful... It's an awful place. How in your right mind do you think that that place is going to be in line to think about focusing on winning? That's why, again, that's why when I bring up the Del Rio stuff, I'm not talking about the political angle of it. I'm just talking about the dumbass angle of it. You don't need anything else to take you off of your objective. You're in that building to win football games. Not elect people or to talk about what's going on in Washington. You are not there for that. You know that line when uh, Laura Ingram said to, to LeBron, shut up and dribble? It's almost appropriate. Shut up and do your job. That's what she should have said. Just shut up and do your job. You're hired to be a basketball guy. Now, look, you want to be a political guy? Do it on your own time. Fine. Don't bring it into my locker room. Just do your job. Don't make our jobs harder. Dude, the Eagles. Hey, watch this. I think of the Cowboys. I think of chaos. I think of the Rams. I, everyone wants to play in Los Angeles. I, everybody wants to be a Ram. They're throwing money around like they're in like the kings of Egypt. Everyone wants to play for Brady and with Brady. Philadelphia is now a place. Watch this. It's cool. AJ Brown's jackass and around. There's competitive balance. Everyone's competing with one another internally too. Teams. Another year older? Look at how Nick Sirianni has kept all the BS. Not that there was any kind of internal issues or anything. Hey, look, it'd be a whole different conversation today if that team had only won six ball games. I, I completely get that. Okay. Really, east side, Jalen Rager is probably the only negative conversation that we have about the Eagles today. Ronald, culture is so important. Look at the Washington commander culture versus the Philadelphia Eagle culture and ask yourself if you were a free agent where you'd want to play. 
<laughs> it used to be a place to want to play with Washington when they were the Redskins. Remember Joe Gibbs? How everybody and free agents wanted to go play for the Redskins back in the day? Remember that? Free agents wanted to play there. Wilbur Marshall wanted to play there. It was a destination for free agents. They won Super Bowls. I mean, they were spectacular in how they would take reclamation projects and put them in the building. It was really well run. Now, you if Washington is one of the teams that you're thinking of going to, you must not have a very good career going for yourself. Chris says, I don't see a roster spot for Rager. Oh, well, I didn't see a roster spot for Derek Barnett either, but they found one. You know what I mean? Trust me, if you're drafted by Howie, you have a chance and you have a lifeline to remain there. Philip, it's a, it's a comment and it's an analogy. Don't make more of it. It's not, it's just a, a comment. Holy cow. Crazy. They're not cutting Rager. I don't think they are either. All right. NFL today came out with the top 10. Actually, top 32. I'm not going through that, though. And the top quarterbacks that will be taken in the top 43 picks. I got that list next. I want to hit on it. Some conversation about it. A little bit on Jalen. Because here are the guys that are going to be the top quarterbacks. Okay? Hit the like button. Keep it right here on the National Football Show. When choosing a lawyer for your injury case, you may ask, does the size of the law firm matter? Well, of course it does. The insurance company, they're huge with unlimited resources. And whether your case is big or small, they're built to bully you out of the money you're owed. But here's the good news. We're big too, the biggest actually. And we're built to fight to make them pay for all that was taken from you. Size is our strength. There's only one Morgan & Morgan, forthepeople.com. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on that can you search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. In Philadelphia, we celebrated the miracle with pride only five years ago. And then the following morning, IBEW Local 98 members went back to work, building this city, rescuing our communities from decay, and inspiring the young men and women of the region to take pride in who we are. Like the cats, Local 98 members believe in hope. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and career opportunities with Local 98, visit us, ibew98.org. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass, free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears.
Welcome back. National Football Show. There's Celio here. Appreciate it. Hey, guys, do me a favor. Hit the like button. Eastside Monster and Chris. Put him at punt return, Devon Allen. <clears throat> Is it Devin Allen? Put put him put him as the punt returner. Yeah. Maybe that's why Howie brought him in to be the punt returner. Man, if that guy can catch a punt return or a kickoff return, and you put that guy with that 4-2 speed out there, hey, I, I, I would give this a shot. How about that, man? Yeah, right? Put him out there like that? I'm good with that. Well, it, hey, gaming. He'd be better than anything that Jalen Rager could be out there. Was he in college? I don't remember him, what he did at Oregon. Question is, can the kid catch and take a hit, Sills? So my wife said the same thing, dude. Hey, listen, I'm friends. I don't know if you guys remember this name. I'm going to throw a name out at you. And I knew him very well. His name was Ronaldo Nehemiah. And Skeets Nehemiah went to Maryland, and he used to come back and train uh, with a guy named Frank Costello at College Park my freshman year. And – there's Nehemiah. He was the first hurdler, 110, to go under 13 seconds. I think he did a 1297 in Munich. And Roger Kingdom's also a friend of mine. Roger Kingdom, get this. Ronaldo Nehemiah only has two losses, and they're in the U.S. qualifiers to Roger Kingdom. Losing to uh, Ronaldo ne Nehemiah. Skeets Nehemiah, man, was a phenomenal hurdler. He just couldn't win the gold, and Kingdom won the golds. And Roger got an opportunity to play with the 49ers. And after getting hit for a couple of years, he was like, you know, I don't know if this is my deal here. Okay? Okay? I mean, right? He can run, though, dude. He can run. Gravy says, Sills, what's the consensus with your NFL buddies on the Eagles this year? I brought that up. I'm going to get to my, my NFL draft this year. Gravy, you missed it in the first hour. Hey. Pete Prisco of CBSSports.com ranked 100 players in the league. Top 100 players. Top 100 players. Jordan Mulata, 75. Darius Slay is 85. Lane Johnson's 90, and A.J. Brown's 94. Those are your highest-ranked players by a guy who's considered to have a lot of push at CBS. Third fastest time, Chris, in high hurdle history is quite a statement. Quite a statement. So, Gravy, the consensus says, there's a lot more question marks when it comes to the Eagles than people are saying inside the city. More of the national folks are looking at it like this. Well, the quarterback, I'm not sure of. The defense wasn't very good last year. Against good, and you didn't beat any good teams last year. You didn't beat a team with a winning record. That, that's the consensus, I think. But they do think they've improved a lot. He's an Eagle hater? Man, I don't know. Four guys, 75 to 94. That's not very good. And I, I don't know. I'm going to have to agree with that. Slay, 85? I know. You mean to tell me he's not one of the top 20 corners? And, and that's another thing. Gravy, think of this for a second here. They're not saying that the Eagles have one player on that roster right now who's a top 10 guy. At any position including A.J. Brown. Slay 80. Um, Allen interview, he had to be humble when he says he's one of the fastest men in the world. He is one of the fastest men in the world. Hey, I'll tell you this. I'd like to see Allen race Tyree Kill. 
Okay, I'd like to see him race Hill. That kid can move. Third fastest time in hurdle history. Dude, hurdles are the hurdles are hard, man. Uh, Davy Boy's right. I don't care how fast he is. Can he catch a football? I'd love to see if that guy could. Be, can you imagine if that guy turned out to be some sort of special special teams guy for you? Holy cow, man! That'd be fantastic if that guy could do that. All right. So as you guys know, I use a scouting service called Bledsoe. And Bledsoe is, and, and, and um, Barrett knows this arm of the NFL. Bledsoe is this, guys. They take the top 2,000 prospects in college football every year, including underclassmen. And what they do is they start whittling them down. And they start whittling them down to the top 400 guys in the country. Then what they do is they give the prospect books to all the teams. Then the particular teams will do this with their scouting departments. Then they'll start traveling around. And then what the what they what they what they are is they identify talent for the teams. And then the teams determine whether or not they have enough talent to make the team and to be NFL guys. So a lot of these projections are going to change once the NFL personnel people get involved in it. Bledsoe's kind of like the first stage. And that's kind of where we are here. First stage. And by the way, they ranked them. This is for the first time they ranked the top players. I'm not going to go all 32 because I don't think that that's productive. But I will tell you the quarterbacks because that could be something – The Eagles could be in the market for. And here are your top 10 guys that they have in order now. The number one player they say that's in college football this year is Will Anderson, edge rusher Bama. We've kind of been saying that he's the best player in the country. He's the most gifted player in the country. Will will that mean next April he goes number one? you know the quarterback position is going to be a priority. So he probably won't be. But Will Anderson is rated the number one player in the country. Xander, what do you have in sacks last year? 17? I think he had like 17 sacks last year. I mean, he if he had gone in this draft this past April, he'd have been the first player taken instead of Walker uh, from Georgia. He'd have been the number one guy. He's 17 and a half. Big, rangy kid. That guy is a beast. I would say this to you. Will Anderson, Xander may fight me on this. Will Anderson is going to be Nick Saban's greatest Bama defender he's ever had. Remember I said that. Will Anderson is his best defensive talent he's ever had. And that says a lot. Now I'm even talking LSU. This kid here is his best player on defense. C.J. Stroud is ranked number two. Quarterback, Ohio State. There's a part of me that's going to say something here that I thought I would never say. Okay? It it, it will be, Xander. Quarterback will go number one. That's why I said this will change. This may be the only quarterback that Ohio State's ever produced that I may actually endorse to be drafted. Number three, Jalen Carter, defensive line, Georgia. This kid, with all those great Georgia players that they had last year, is right there with every every other one of them. He is another great-looking player. Kirby Smart has done a whale of a job, okay? 
a well of a job at recruiting on defense. So that's his forte. Isn't like five quarterbacks going in the top 20. I don't know about that. Number five, or excuse me, number four. This shocked me. This is not my rankings. These are Bledstow's. Bryce Young, quarterback, Alabama. The fourth rated player going into the next April draft is Bryce Young. Obviously, the scouts are saying that his height, it may be a question, but it's not going to be an overall concern when it comes to taking him. We're talking top five here. And most likely will improve. He's going to play this year. So that standing may actually improve. If he goes out and wins a national championship and another Heisman Trophy, you got to think he's going to move ahead of Stroud. Even though Stroud has the physical tools, it looks to be a prototypical NFL guy. Number five, Miles Murphy. You know what the school, I want to show you something here when we're done with this too. And this is something that Howie's getting smart at. Miles Murphy, edge rusher, Clemson. You know, I'm going to get Dabo Sweeney on. You know, it's time to talk to Coach Sweeney about some college ball, so I'm going to get him on again. Um, They're saying that this kid here is another one of these great defensive linemen coming out of – Clemson puts out some great football players. Dabo recruits Clemson like an SEC team. Do you know years and years ago, Clemson was in the Southeastern Conference – I know, isn't that crazy? They were an SEC team. They petitioned, they petitioned, uh, petitioned to get out of the SEC to go into the ACC. This was like back in the eighties, I think it was early eighties. They were at one time an SEC team. Will Levis, quarterback, Kentucky, number six. A lot of people love this kid. A lot of people are saying he could be the number one overall selection. In the NFL draft. Kayshawn Booty. Wide receiver LSU. There they are again. This kid's a baller man. I don't know what they do. At LSU. But let me put it to you this way man. Ed Ogeron. If you ever wanted to get talent. Into your football program. You hire that guy. Because Coach O is going to bring him in. This kid, they're talking Justin Jefferson shit. Number eight, Trenton Simpson, linebacker, Clemson. Clemson had a down year, and they were 10-3 and three last year. That's a down year. Like at Bama. Okay, hey, Bama was 12-2. and two. Were they 12-2 and two last year? Right, they got beat by AM and then they got beat by Georgia in the title game. I think they were 12 and 2. That's a down year. I love that. Hey, what's your down year? Yeah, man, we have to rebuild. We're 12 and 2. <laughs> Most teams would kill to win 12 games in a season. I have. You're 12 and 2 and you rebuild. Dude, when you we were 10 and 1 and we were rebuilding. It's crazy. When you when you're in that kind of place. And you're you're like, hey, you're t- you're ten and two, <laughs> or you're like twelve and two. You're rebuilding. <laughs> Number nine, Antonio Johnson, safety, Texas A and M. They do a good job of recruiting. Texas A and M got to start winning some ball games, though. Hey, Dumbo Fisher, dude, he makes eight million dollars a year. Got to start winning some big games. They beat Bama last year. That's a big game. That's a big game. But now you got to start beating some meaningful games. SEC title games, national championships. Those are meaningful. These are big games. Texas A&M beating Bama is a big game. But meaningful games, SEC titles, and and, and national championships. Those are the meaningful games you want to be in. You want to play in those games. You want to win those games. 
Brian Brees, D-line, Clemson. So let me show you something here. Bama, Ohio State, Georgia, Bama, Clemson, Kentucky, LSU, Clemson, Texas A&M, Clemson. I mean, if you recruited from that pool of talent, Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State, Bama, LSU, Texas A&M, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. That's what Howie's starting to do. Just go get some more SEC guys. I'm going to get to him in a minute. Chris, I'll get to him in a sec here. So those are your top 10 guys. Here is the top five quarterbacks that are in the top 43 picks. Okay? Obviously, you heard the first three. C.J. Stroud, Ohio State. Bryce Young, number four, Bama. Number six is Will Levis, Kentucky. Tyler Van Dyke, University of Miami, is number 29. And Anthony Richardson, Gators, is number 43. Those are your top five. Could there be as many as six go in the top 32? Yes, because of the importance of the position. Van Dyke, it could move up. Okay, but Tyler Van Dyke, if you're the Eagles, Howie, give me a call. (laughs) Howie, tell Bob Lang to give me a call. Listen, no grudges, no nothing. I talk to Tyler every week. It's a Connecticut thing. It's a Kane's thing, actually. Morning, EC. Okay. Xander goes, I'll take TBD. Hold on, Kenneth. What if I told you that on Friday... Tyler would like to come on. Howie. Howie, Howie, Howie. Oh, in the end, how they need me. Howie, I told Bob Lang, too, to watch this segment of the program. Bob. You know Tracy's my boy. Tyler Van Dyke loves the Eagles. He's from Connecticut, so it's not that far drive up 95. I can help out here a little bit. I'm only here to help. Enzo, what can I do for you, my friend? You know, one day your Don may not call on you, but when that day does come, I may ask for a service. Until that day, my friend, enjoy my daughter's wedding. (laughs) Sills campaigning. I'm not kidding. No, 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 no. Sills doing pretty. Hey, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Kenneth, you know, I, you know, Tyler goes, what are the fans like? Fantastic. What's the stadium like? I go, been there 10 times. It's spectacular. In this little, like, sports park, they got Wells Fargo right there. It's really dope, actually. And actually, they got a shitload of parking there, a lot of tailgating. It's pretty cool. Actually, you know, I I, I actually like where the whole thing's set up. Army-Navy loves it there. James says you should be a salesman. I am. I sell myself every day. Still trying to get in the agent game. Oh, no, 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 no. You know what Tyler asked me, though? Sills. 
can you hook me up with some people down in my, I go, yeah, I got just the folks for you. Why don't you go over and see my friends over at the Fountain Blue. Fountain Blue follows me on Twitter. And that's my destination of choice when I stay in Miami. So he goes over there and the general manager goes, we've been expecting you. So they're going to try to sign a nil deal with them to help them out promote the, uh, the hotel. Tyler texts me back. He goes, damn, I went there. I drove there with my buddies. <laughs> I was like, yeah, he goes, any, any place else I go. Yeah. Try quarter deck too. Those are my friends too. They own 10 of them down there. Allison goes, we love your accent. Why? Cause I sound like I'm from South Philly. That's why. No, no, no. Chris, Van Dyke makes more money than Hertz. <laughs> he makes more money. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate it. Thank you. Love the plug you just slipped in. Free room. <laughs> oh, gravy. Oh, uh, what? I don't mean quarter deck wings, clams, and beer. Absolutely. They're good friends of mine. So let me text him. Hang on for a second here. Hey, Howie, can you hang on for a minute? Tyler Van Dyke. Here we go. There we go. Oh, by the way, don't forget Ice Cube tomorrow. Yeah, let me see here. Okay. Dear Tyler, the Philadelphia, would you guys, hold on, Tyler, Philadelphia fans want you as their quarterback next year if Jalen shits the bed. Send. See what he says. Howie, I'm here to help. I'm here to I'm here to help. I'm a helper. Not a herder. No. Oh, in case some of you are asking, Sills, your connection with UM? I'm a legend at that place. <laughs> I'm a legend at that place. Dance it. The Rock calls me a legend. Tyler. Be an honor to play in Philly. Wow. See how he, how easy it is. See how he simple, Bob, simple kid who's going to be a top fifteen player taken, who's a Heisman Trophy candidate, six four and a half, two hundred thirty five pounds, has a cannon for an arm. Has an old lineman on the team, too, who's going to go in the top 20 picks. I'm going to – watch this. I'm going to be the middleman here to help in case we need to, like, work something out here. By the way, I'll invoice you later. <laughs> oh, I'll invoice you. And by the way, all of Utes – that are in here watching, I'm going to bill all you too. But then again, you guys, you guys pay the bill every day by hitting the like button. See, Sills already trying to push Hertz out the door. <laughs> Stop, Sills. I'm getting excited. <laughs> Dejan, Sills is daydreaming right now. Sills is. Losing Florida talent to UFFSU and outside the state. Yeah, not with Mario in the building. That's coming back. 
Why don't you get Tyler on the show? Well, James, why don't we? Why don't we, James? Hey, before before we 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 run through the tape here, I want to thank everybody for coming along, including Howie Roseman and Bob Lang. And I'll do my best because I'm here for everybody in Philly and the NFL world and football world. I'm a helper. Ice Cube tomorrow, 3.30. Should be a lot of fun. Please hit the like button. Hollis was... Not Lenny Dykstra, but he was salty. That was a fun interview with him, too. We did that in hour number two. Please go back and watch it. Till tomorrow, 3 to 6 Eastern, we'll see you on the flip side.